Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the city, uh, city council, city of Lakewood, Colorado, on July 9th, 2018, at 7 p.m. Will the clerk please read the roll? Paul here. Johnson here. Vincent here. Vita here. Franks here. Royball here. Gutwine here. Skilling here. Harrison here. Abel here. Lebeer here. You have a quorum. Great. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, who's joining us this evening, whether live or checking in later or streaming. Um, like to ask all in attendance, if you do have a cell phone, please put it on silence. We're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silent prayer. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Will the clerk please read item four. Item four, Proclamation Parks and Recreation Month. Ms. Newland, you're going to join me? All right, I'm gonna ask, ask Councilor LeBeer to please read this proclamation. Sure, whereas parks and recreation programs are an integral part of communities throughout this country, including the city of Lakewood, and whereas our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of all citizens, and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of a community and region, and whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas parks and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expression of local, expansion of local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of business and crime reduction, and whereas parks and, and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitat for wildlife, and whereas the United States House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and whereas the City of Lakewood recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation resources. Now, therefore, on behalf of the City Council, and the people of the city of Lakewood, Colorado, and your mayor, Adam Paul, the city of Lakewood, Colorado, by virtue of the authority vested in me, do hereby proclaim July 2018 Parks and Recreation Month. This is always a fun one. And uh, as you heard, we uh, take great pride in our recreational amenities and opportunities in the city of Lakewood with over half of our city or not over half a quarter of our city being dedicated parkland and of course our wonderful facilities and programs and so with that I'm going to turn it over to Kit to talk a little bit more and, and keep in mind we're coming off of a master plan update that we did last year so we look forward to many more years of uh, recreational excellence. Thank you. Yep. Thank you Mr. Mayor. And good evening, City Council. My name is Kit Newland. I'm the Director of Community Resources, and I'm pleased to accept this proclamation recognizing the importance and benefits of parks and recreation. As evidenced by sheer numbers, Lakewood residents really do appreciate their park and recreation opportunities. I wanted to give you some data from 2016. Um, so just bear with me while I read off some of this data for you. And we had 765,000 people participate in 6,300 programs. At our two golf courses together, we hosted 105,000 rounds of golf. We provided 23,500 one-way trips through Lakewood Rides. 191 children were served through early childhood education programs. 186,000 people attended cultural and heritage programs. 
462 people visited recreation centers and over 450,000 visited Bear Creek Lake Park. For this year's Park and Recreation Month celebration, we wanted to enhance our web page so that everybody has easy access to all the activities and programs that are going on. And there is a lot going on this year. And a lot of those activities are free or very low cost. I wanted to just provide you with a little bit of information about some of those activities. They include yoga, Zumba, aqua Zumba, meditation in the park, family nature programs, swim nights, and best of all, everybody's favorite, the free family-friendly movie in the park. This year's feature is the Lego Ninja Go movie. You got to go see it. It's awesome, I hear. And that's on July 15th at the Lakewood Heritage Center. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that we've been working really hard over these last couple years to get the word out more about our um, Lakewood Possibilities Fund. And as a result, this year, the staff came up with the idea to sell these t-shirts about the benefits in, of Parks and Recreation. This is an NR, National Recreation and Park um, Association logo that says, a Parks and Recreation, a lifetime of discovery. And these were selling at the rec centers for $10, and the, the proceeds are going to go straight to the scholarship fund. So we invite you and your neighbors um, to take a visit, visit the rec center, and take advantage of some of the fun stuff, and then also purchase a t-shirt. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor LeBeer. And that was a fun presentation. I'm just going to add to that real quick. In the Denver Business Journal um, that just came out, largest attendance increases from 2016 to 2017. Uh, Lakewood Heritage, Culture, and Arts went up 14%. So that's fantastic. And that's um, in front of it, Denver Art Museum, Butterfly Pavilion, and the Colorado Symphony. Well done. Okay, so next up, I'll have the clerk read item five and six. So we're going to do it kind of simultaneously. Item five, presentation advisory commission for an inclusive community proposal on youth tobacco. And item six, presentation advisory commission for an inclusive community proposal on name change and purpose statement. All right, and so because we have some interest there was a separate roster for public comment. So I'm going to do public comment currently on the ACIC presentations. We had a request from our friends at um, the Tobacco Prevention Initiative to have 10 minutes. And it sounds like we have some uh, of the folks from the Tobacco Reelers, Re Retailers Association as well as others. So if you would like to speak on either items five or six, we will go through that. And then we will have regular public comment for all other non-agenda items. So to kick this off, we will start with Citizens for a Healthier Lakewood. Good evening. Welcome. Yes, we can turn on the document. I'll wait till we're all Please. here. Great. This is Squeeze giving me. Squeeze in. There we go. Squeeze in. We got room. Hi, everybody. We are the Citizens for a Healthier Lakewood, and we're back. I am Charmaine Britton, and I am a resident of Ward 1. I'm also the mother of an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old. Um, and because my son graduated, he, I attended a whole bunch of graduation parties, and unfortunately I saw way too much vaping by the high school students. Um, it made me very sad. And I'm here today to, we're here to address the issue of youth tobacco and doing some responsible retail licensing so that everyone can do the right thing related to youth tobacco. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank 
the ACIC. They've done a lot of work on this. Um, we started this process almost, I think, a year and a half ago, and we appreciate their hard work and diligence and keeping this alive. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we um, want to help youth not get hooked on tobacco and through responsible retail licensing, not overly harsh, but just responsible. Um, so first of all, I'd like to talk about some data. Preliminary data from, I have to read this, the National Research Center Tobacco and Health Survey. Perhaps you don't know about that yet, but that's something that just came out in 2018, um, and it's fresh off the press. It is preliminary. And what they found is that 83% of Lakewood residents thought that retailers were already had to have a license in order to sell tobacco. And 71% of residents support retail licensing. That means about 128,000 of our residents believe that it was already happening. Um, did you know that other things require a license. Did you know that a license is required to buy ice or to purchase fireworks? How many people have dogs? We all have to have licenses. Christmas trees require a license. Um, but you know what does not require a license? Tobacco. To sell tobacco to, to youth. And we hope that we can uh, convince you all to change that with some responsible retail licensing. Um, so in other words, there's no license for the deadliest consumer product, and we know that uh, tobacco can kill. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to talk to you about licensing at the local level. Colorado is only one of 10 states that does not have statewide licensing for tobacco. Um, so that's why it needs to happen here in Lakewood. Um, and tonight, you're going to hear some members of our coalition, these wonderful people behind me. You're going to hear their stories. You're going to hear some data, because we need to make evidence-informed decisions. Um, and most of all, you're going to hear their passion about why this is so important. So thank you very much for listening to us. And also, I have the honor of introducing our youth representative. Good evening. My name is Tasman Duncan, and I'm a senior at Lakewood High School. I'm here today with Citizens for a Healthier Lakewood in order to give support for a potential city ordinance requiring non-cigarette tobacco retailers to be licensed. 90% of tobacco users start before the age of 18. My mom is part of that statistic. She started smoking when she was my age, and after 40 years, seven failed attempts to quit, and the beginning signs of lung and sinus-related illnesses, she's still smoking. I grew up constantly around secondhand smoke, and I still experience it today. I hate it, my parents hate it, but they can't stop because it's addictive. My mom's story is by no means unique and by no means the most tragic story out there. In fact, tobacco kills more than 480,000 people a year in the United States alone. It begins when someone my age or younger first uses tobacco. The face of tobacco to my age group has changed. Kids nowadays, well, we rarely go smack, smoke a pack of Marlboros behind the bleachers. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, instead, vape and jewel products have taken cigarettes' place. Um, This is a jewel, small, sleek, and easily mistaken for a flash drive. It emits less smoke, enough that it doesn't trigger the bathroom smoke detectors, and is easily snuck into and used in schools. It, locks, it lacks that toxic cigarette smell, and it comes in lots of flavors like mint and cotton candy that appeal to kids my age. It is positively everywhere in schools, in the hallways, outside on campus, and the more bold students will even smoke in the classroom. This isn't just true of high schools either. When helping the city of Golden do compliance checks, 
The officer we were working with mentioned that the kids from uh, their middle school had been getting tobacco from the Walgreens across the street. It seemed crazy, inconceivable to me that um, kids younger than me, middle school kids, had been smoking tobacco, so I talked to my best friend's little sister, a middle schooler at Creighton Middle School, and she confirmed what I'd heard, that tobacco was everywhere in their halls as well. Um, this may seem alarming, but with our current laws, it's not actually that difficult for children under the age of 18 to obtain tobacco. In fact, 68% um, of youth under the age of 18 who attempt to buy tobacco can complete the transaction. I've seen from compliance checks that I've done that this statistic is true. I believe that a licensing law will impose real stakes upon um, retailers and lessen that statistic making it more difficult for kids to obtain tobacco and helping it to keep it out of schools. I hope that the city council will put such a law in place. Thank you very much. Mayor and council members, my name is Diana Meyer. I'm an epidemiologist and resident of Ward 4 and a member of the Citizens for a Healthier Lakewood. My best friend's parents both died due to their tobacco and nicotine addiction, and sadly, my best friend has continued the addiction and is vaping now. Compared to alcohol and marijuana license, a tobacco retail license is low cost and effective to reduce the high cost of youth tobacco use and addiction. An annual fee of a few hundred dollars is small, for the average of $18,000 a month on tobacco sales. The license fee does not affect retailers' legal sales. It helps them comply with the law. Fees and local enforcement both deter the sales. In Colorado communities with local licensing of non-cigarette tobacco retailers, illegal sales to minors were reduced by 76% and 94% of Coloradans believe that stores that sell tobacco to a minor should have their license suspended. Consequences for violations should be suspension of the ability to sell and revoking for repeat offenses. Tobacco licensing works and protects the health of our community. In fact, we have over 125 endorsements to date for supporting tobacco-free laws in Lakewood. Thank you. Those are some of our, can I just say this? Yes. These are our supporters here, and we have many of them here tonight with us as well. Okay. Would, can I leave these for you? Sure. You bet we'll give them to the clerk. My name is Michael McLaughlin. I live in Ward 1 in Lakewood. My fellow coalition members believe, as I do, in the benefits of prevention over intervention. It is easier to address youth access to tobacco through prevention than to try to intervene after a child grows into adulthood addicted to cigarettes or e-cigarettes. Since health for all is our goal, prevention is the best way of addressing factors affecting community health. I personally was shocked to hear from teens that they find access easy to products that expose them to the dangers of nicotine and the risks of addiction. According to a Healthier Kids Colorado survey from 2015, 57% of high school students believe that it is easy to purchase tobacco products. And youth who perceive tobacco as relatively easy to get also are more likely to become regular users. Since a main resource for getting access to these products is other teens, having a tobacco retail license can ensure that a minimum clerk age for selling tobacco products is 18 and older, since young clerks are more likely to sell to their peers. The city council is responsible for the health and safety and welfare of the citizens and make the community safe through the monitoring of food, monitoring the quality of food, ensuring safe working conditions for employees, 
and enforcing alcohol sales regulations. Therefore, you as a council should join other communities such as Golden, Edgewater, and Aspen to pass tobacco ordinances in order to reduce teen access to tobacco as they have seen reduction in sales of tobacco to youth in their communities. The members of the Citizens for a Healthier Lakewood asks the City Council to support the findings of the ACIC and refer this issue to city staff. For drafting this ordinance, a tobacco retail license ordinance makes sense for Lakewood and makes sense to protect our youth. I think that's it. All right. And we'll be back again. Yes, you will. All right. Thank you very much. And so just for reference, um, this group had requested a time to speak ahead of time to consolidate. Everybody's allowed three minutes, so they asked to have a consolidation into 10 minutes, which we grant for groups and uh, HOAs and neighborhood associations. So now it'll be three minutes for the rest of the public comment. Um, this little light here on the box will be green for two and a half, yellow for 30 seconds, and red when your three minutes is up, and we'll politely try to wrap you up. Next up, we have Tracy Doyle. Good evening, Mayor Paul and council members. My name is Tracy Doyle. I'm a technical assistance provider in the tobacco program at CU Denver. As you are most likely aware, there are two entities that perform periodic compliance checks in Colorado to make sure retailers are not selling to minors. One is the Colorado Department of Revenue. I don't know how to turn this on. And the other is the FDA. As we don't have a system in Lakewood to track everyone who sells these age-restricted tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, it's estimated that we have about 135 retailers in Lakewood. Uh, if you take a look at the chart, okay. you'll see in 2017, this is all for FDA except for the last one, that Lakewood stores that sold to a minor were 14 out of 66, or 21%. That's compared to the state average of 10%, according to DOR. The Lakewood stores that were inspected by FDA was 57 of 135, so only 42% of stores were even inspected in 2017. Now, of the 14 stores that sold to a minor, 36% of those stores had previous sales to minors. Five out of 14. So what does that tell us? It tells me that we have a problem in Lakewood. If we apply this 21% illegal sales rate to all tobacco retailers in Lakewood, we can surmise that 28 retailers in Lakewood are not checking IDs properly and are selling tobacco to our youth. The conclusions that can be drawn from this table are one, too few compliance checks are being conducted. Two, the sales rate of tobacco to youth in Lakewood is staggeringly high compared to the state average. And three, repeat offenders are clearly not deterred by weak penalties resulting from breaking state and federal law. You've already heard about the important reasons for the adoption of a tobacco retail license. What I would like to emphasize is the importance of a well-funded, well-supported enforcement program with escalating consequences for selling the number one cause of preventable disease and death in the U.S. to a youth. The tobacco control team at CU Denver has worked with communities across the state to plan and draft strong ordinances. We can provide free technical assistance, including legal technical assistance, to Colorado communities to ensure that a tobacco retail licensing ordinance is comprehensive and addresses the unique needs of Lakewood around provisions, administration, and enforcement. With an estimated 135 tobacco retail outlets or more, meeting the best practice minimum of two undercover compliance checks a year would pose a clear burden on your law enforcement agency's resources. We are very interested in working with you regarding models that follow what's been done successfully 
in other states and communities to lessen the enforcement burden for Lakewood PD without compromising effective enforcement protocols. It has been my privilege, privilege to work with cities and towns such as Edgewater, Golden, and Fountain to ensure that enforcement is consistent, includes tested protocols, and is followed through with meaningful fines or suspensions. We welcome the opportunity to support your community in committing to the health and safety of youth through the implementation of a non-cigarette tobacco retail licensing ordinance. Thank you for your time and attention. Errol, come on down. Good evening. All right. I'm tall, so can you hear me okay? Uh, good evening. I'm Carol Salzman, Vice President for Community and Government Affairs at Lutheran Medical Center. And it's my privilege to talk to you a little bit tonight about our concerns and uh, recommendations. So uh, at this time, Mayor and Council, we are in support of the Advisory Council's or Advisory Commission's uh, recommendations to reduce use tobacco. Lutheran was one of the first hospitals in the state of Colorado to adopt a tobacco-free campus, and we continue to implement programs and seek out partnerships that help to reduce not only youth tobacco use, but for new mothers and adults as well. Uh, we're one of the largest employers in the county and a healthcare leader, as you know, and we agree with other health and public health authorities that tobacco and preventing tobacco use is a public health priority and we want it to be your priority too. It is more cost effective for preventative measures to address the negative health, economic, social, and psychological outcomes caused by or associated with tobacco use. Evidence shows that living tobacco-free lowers your risk. It lowers your risk for serious health conditions like cancer, heart disease, type two diabetes, and lung disease as well as premature death. This is evidence-based. As a longtime member of the Jeffco Tobacco-Free Alliance, Lutheran supports tonight's recommendations, and we view this as a positive step in the right direction, and it's in support of things that the city has taken on in the past uh, in this topic. Again, I invite you to strongly uh, consider the recommendations made by the Advisory Commission tonight and help our community in a very responsible and reasonable way make a difference for the youth in our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Kramer. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, uh, my name is Ken Kramer, general counsel for the Cigarette Store Corp. We operate tobacco shops in Colorado, uh, two in Lakewood under the name Smoker Friendly. We also run gas stations and liquor stores in the state. We employ over 250 uh, persons in Colorado, 10 in Lakewood. Um, tonight, the city council has received recommendations from the advisory commission to address the issue of youth access to tobacco products. Many of the recommendations focus on tobacco retailers as the primary source of underage persons obtaining tobacco. Retailers are not the problem. The report references the Jefferson County Public Health Department and its figure of over 60% of Colorado minors being able to buy tobacco products. The report also references a Citizens for Healthier Lakewood statistic from 2016 that four stores were checked and sold, uh, three of those sold to minors. These references might lead one to believe that minors are able to buy tobacco products from retail stores at will. I can tell you that that's not a fair representation generally of what's going on in the tobacco community and specifically not at our stores. Smoker Friendly and other responsible tobacco retailers believe that tobacco products are intended for adults. It's a legal product. They're not meant to be possessed or used by minors. Let me explain to you our program and training. Every employee first goes through an extensive training program before they're allowed to 
operate the register. No one is allowed to operate a register without, having, without being mentored one-on-one -on -one in the store. Every employee is told that if they fail a sting, they will be terminated immediately, no questions asked. We subject our employees not only to the FDA and Department of Revenue stings, but a we card program and secret shopper programs that's employed by a program known as BARS. Over 600 BARS checks um, were employed at our store on West Alameda this year. All of those were successful. Our employees are given a bonus if they pass a check. We have over a 93% pass rate on our checks and our, on our quote stings. It's disingenuous to believe that there is no step discipline from the FDA. There are already federal laws out there which govern the sale of tobacco to minors. If you violate those laws, you have severe financial penalties. As I said earlier, tobacco retailers are not the problem. Social sources are the real problem. In 2016, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration published the findings of the agency's PATH study, or Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Study, which demonstrate that the vast majority of underage youth obtain access to tobacco from non-retail sources. These social sources include older friends, adult age siblings, parents, and even sometimes strangers. Minors rely on these social sources and use various methods to obtain access to cigarettes 86.1% of the time and electronic cigarettes 89.5% of the time. Until all levels of government focus on solving the social sources problem, there will not be a significant reduction in youth access to tobacco products. A societal attitude change needs to occur so that adults understand that it's not permissible to provide tobacco to minors. The FDA's number one recommendation is to promote educational efforts to reduce, reduce youth access to smoking. As noted in the FDA's analysis, the 2011 through 2017 National Youth Tobacco Sur Survey, tobacco among middle and high school students is declining. As the City Council deliberates the ACIC report, I ask that you include tobacco retailers in its process. Whatever the City Council ultimately decides will have consequences for Lakewood tobacco retailers. I think it's important for city officials to have an understanding and appreciation for the retail community and allow us to participate in the process of developing sound and meaningful tobacco policies for Lakewood. Great. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak either on the tobacco or the name change proposal? All right. Seeing none, I'll close public comment on both of those. Oh, we do. Okay. Come on down. I'll just ask for your name and your address for the record, please. Good evening, welcome. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Yeah. Um, my name is Monica Vondreska. I own two vape shops in Colorado, one in Denver, one in Arvada, and I also manufacture e-liquid here in Lakewood. Um, from the testimony that I've heard tonight, I just want all of you to know that us retailers, us shop owners are doing everything that we can in order not to have minors in possessions of our products. Um, my store has been checked by the FDA multiple times this year as well as last year. Um, and we do implement programs such as the WeCard program and those things in order to make sure that my employees aren't serving minors um, as well. Sorry, my voice is a little shaky. You're fine, don't worry about it. Um, as well, um, any of my employees who do, do service a minor are fired on the spot. They have no room in my store. They have no room in my city. 
And if you're a minor in possession of nicotine products, please throw them away. There's no use, use in starting a habit that you don't need. Um, it, it's just very concerning with a testimony from some of the public health tonight that they're mixing in combustible cigarette statistics with vaping statistics. Um, the CDC has just recently come out along with um, Public Health UK, along with Australia and New Zealand, um, reversing their ban on these products because they see the use in adult, adults being able to switch to less harmful product. Um, UK Public Health um, cites e-cigarettes as being 95% um, less harmful than cigarettes. And with a permitting process, we're just, we're scared that it's gonna limit the access to adult smokers who are looking to switch into a healthier lifestyle. Um, anyone that comes in to my shop that is currently smoking that would love to switch to vaping, they know the risks. They will always know the risks. They will also know the benefits. They will also get additional years on their life seeing their grandchild walk down the aisle, seeing them graduate, spending more time with their husband or wife. Those are all things that we want current adult smokers to be able to access in order to make their lives better. It is incredibly difficult to switch from combustible cigarettes even to vaping. And it's, and it's even more difficult to get rid of them completely. We just want an open forum where we can be a part of the conversation so we're not cutting off the adult smokers that could greatly use these less harmful products in order to stop smoking. Thank you. Thank you. Could you just stop by the clerk and give her your address? Of course. Quick. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir, please. Good evening. Hello. I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> my, <laughs> my name is Sean. Um, I own two vape shops in Colorado. One here in Lakewood, which was actually my first shop, and I have one in Centennial. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. Uh, we opened them because it was the only thing that ever helped us quit smoking combustible cigarettes. And I'm not 100% opposed to the special tobacco licensing um, where others might be. The reason why is because that's not gonna change how I structure and run my business because we already diligently ID people. We already have disciplinary actions in place if we do fail. So you'll get your $300 or 500 or whatever annually out of me, that's fine. Um, the one thing that I am concerned about is if we give you an inch, you take a mile. So if you want to keep it out of the use hands, I totally support that. But if you want to take it out of the way the, the responsible adult's hands is a viable option, I am not okay with that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Could you do the same? Just stop by the clerk and give her your name and address. Anybody else? Yes, please. And for reference, I, I don't think there's any recommendation to do anything for anybody above 18. Right. So. Oh, of course. I've got three kids. I smoked 30 years. E-cigarettes was the only thing that got me off. Picking butts out of cans, whatever, I didn't care. I started at 11. You know, back then it was 89 cents a pack. And I want licensing. I own two vape shops, one in here in Lakewood, right there at the A to Z rental place, and then one in Frisco, Colorado as well. I'm doing this not to get rich. I had an option to do marijuana or do what helped me. I do what helped me and make a little money. Why not? You know what I mean? I have three kids. One just graduated from Pomona. The other one's in Pomona High School. We live in Arvada, but subliminal messages from 18 year olds sitting across the street from the high school vaping as I go drop them off, they see that. And I just remember when I was 14, getting into high school, whoa, big blowing of the mind, you know? Seeing all these seniors playing football, you know, living life, living like adults. We want to relate with that, especially when we're 14 years old. 
So when we see them sitting over there across the street, subliminally we're talking to our friends going, hey, I want to try that. And that's where it starts. You know, they've been doing in Aspen, you guys mentioned that earlier, T21. Let's do T19. Nobody is 19 years old in high school. Nobody's going to be sitting across that street vaping if they're 19. But definitely, definitely do a better licensing. We totally agree with that. I've been checked out by the FDA once, passed. And again, just like these other guys, we do the same thing at my shop. We're very, very strict on that. And they will get fired immediately. No problem with unemployment. I'll do that all day. But I got kids, and my kids don't do it. And I'm very strict on them about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Do you mind stopping by the clerk? And Not Thank you. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Anything on the name change? All right. We're going to close public comment. Thank you all very much. We're going to move into the presentation phase. And we are honored to have the uh, chair of our Civic Awareness Committee, Diane Duffy, and ACIC Secretary, Nicole Mal Malandri, Malandri, to uh, give us a presentation. So thank you and welcome. And Miss Duffy, I think you're going to do both. Yeah, you're going to see me a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. All right. That's good. So again, my name is Diane Duffy. I'm the chair of the Civic Awareness Committee. Nicole Melandry. She helped. Uh, she's the secretary of our commission now, but she was on the Civic Awareness when we were working on this project. Big project. The um, the assignment. The assignment was lengthy, so the research that you received in your packets for this evening was lengthy also. We did a lot of research. We looked at a lot of different places for our statistics and for what really works because we too are concerned with youth tobacco use. And this all is directed, if you look at the assignment, it's all about youth tobacco use. So I'm not gonna go back, I'm not gonna go back over this <laughs> lengthy assignment. Um, and I'm not going to go back through all the research. I hope you had some time to go through through some of it. We did see that smoking is uh, one of the largest preventable causes of death in our country. And according to the statistics that we found, 90% of all regular smokers start before age 18. And that is the legal age to purchase tobacco products. Why is that? Why is our youth trying their best to get a hold of this. Now, in this age of high tech, the new vaping is attractive. This is the berry flavored. It's, it has a nice scent and a nice flavor, and it's attracting the youth. So we saw this as an enticement. We also were concerned as we researched about the volume of compliance checks that the state and the FDA is able to do. They're doing our whole state of Colorado. So how much percentage are they really able to dedicate to our city in, in Lakewood? So we found there were low compliance checks and minimal penalties, really. Um, I think the, the retailers have far more harsh penalties than our state does on these things. What are the deterrents to stop the youth from, from trying to obtain these products? It's, by, it's not by accident that education is listed first. Th there's no, no alternative. I mean, education is the best. To educate them about the, the issues that, that come with, with smoking. That's really important. Increased regulation also has an effect. The enforcement. We looked at raising the minimum age, and we also looked at increasing the sales tax. But more importantly, we looked at what are other cities in Colorado doing? And as has been mentioned, seven of the Colorado cities have licensed the non-cigarette tobacco products. Two of the Colorado cities have gone ahead and licensed all tobacco, including cigarettes and you saw the differentiation in your research of whether you license cigarettes 
or just non-cigarette tobacco. And we did give you a definition of what constitutes non-cigarette tobacco. Other things you can discuss um, that we found other cities were doing was no self-service display. They can't walk in and just pick it off the shelf. Tobacco products are behind the counter and a clerk has to get them for you and scrutinize your age a little bit. None of us are gonna have a problem with that. Restrict the age of the sales clerk. Um, that some cities thought that that might help that if they were a little older, they wouldn't have younger underage friends coming in that they could slide them to. And some cities um, have uh, regulations, again, on accompanied minors in retail outlets that sell tobacco. Some also went to the extent of zoning. Now that's a bit much, but it's what other cities have done, and we just wanted to provide you with what other cities have done. Now, Nicole is going to take over and go through what we recommend based on all of our research. Thank you. So our research found two recommendations we'd like to present and start with. Uh, first, promotes and support education efforts concerning youth tobacco use. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of varied information concerning e-cigarettes and vaping. Jeffco Public Health has several youth programs currently. Uh, Breathe Easy teams are high school clubs focused on preventing tobacco use, and there is currently a team in Lakewood High School. Not on Tobacco program is the Smoking Cessation program focused for teens. Second Chance is a web-based tobacco education program for middle and high schoolers who have violated a law and for tobacco use. And in addition, get involved with Protect Our Youth Efforts and TobaccoFreeColorado.org, which is a project of the Colorado Department of Health and Public uh, Health and Environments uh, State Tobacco Education Prevention and Cessation Programs. For licensing retailers, there are two alternatives. Licensed non-cigarette tobacco product retailers. This would allow the city to retain the state t tobacco tax revenue, which is roughly $350,000 per year. Or license all tobacco retail product um, retailers. This would send the strongest message. However, the city would forfeit all tobacco tax revenue. ACIC suggests option A, since it achieves all the benefits of licensing without losing the tax revenue. We surveyed a few businesses and found most sell both cigarettes and the other various tobacco products, including the chew, sweet cigars, uh, snuff, vaping materials, and e-cigarettes. And finally, uh, thank you to everyone on the committee for helping with this assignment. Well done. And could we have those folks stand if you're here? I see some of them in the audience who worked on this committee. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay, so before we go into the next presentation, let's see if there's council questions as to uh, this first presentation. Councilor Vincent. Um, my question is, as you talked about um, Lakewood High School and the Breathe Easy program, do you know if any other high schools have that program? That's the only high school in Lakewood. It's also um, in a couple other high schools, but Lakewood proper high school. Okay, so do you know if there's anything that would start this program in other high schools? We've got several high schools in Lakewood other than Lakewood High School. One of the young ladies that spoke earlier is the head of the one at Lakewood, as she mentioned. Would you like to ask her that question? Y yes. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> We're going to have to have you come down to the mic, yeah, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. um, I am in my school's BE team. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself the head of it, um, but I have been a dedicated member for about a year now. Um, and there are other schools that are linked in with us. I don't believe any of them are in Lakewood, but my, the BE team would be interested in having other schools join our ranks. And um, 
also in maybe getting our message out there a little more. We're a small uh, program. We meet during lunches. There's five or six of us in the club at our school. Because if it is successful, I'd like to see it. I'd support replicating it through other high schools in Lakewood. Thank you. All right, let's continue with questions. Councilor Abel. I'd like to say it's a great job the ACIC did yet again. Thank you very much. It's very thorough. Uh, Ms. Hodson, uh, I don't see a financial representative here with this $350,000 in uh, tax revenue be Tabor attributable? Hmm. I believe it is, but I would need to check w to make sure. But it's just a basic tax, and it isn't um, exempted by any of the other, like uh, it's not a federal grant, it isn't open space. So I believe it is, but I would need to double check with our finance director. <clears throat> the implication of that is that we might have to give back $350,000 anyway. So thank you. And, and Councilor Abel, to that point, I think with the recommendation, if it is to go forward, that's certainly, I think, the next step would be a study session where we would have a full conversation with staff as to all the impl implementations sure. here. Councilor Harrison. Going along with that idea, um, the, uh, the cost factors that you said in there about the whether or not um, there was a, a fee for the licensing that you suggested in there anywhere from 233 to bigger. <laughs> as big as you like. Okay. Um, did you have kind of a, a gut feeling for what would it take to cover all the costs on a regular basis? I know you had two employees and a um, buy money and um, a youth purchaser. Um, did you have a, a cost? We didn't. Our research didn't go that far to come up with the dollars. That's something that staff can do for you. That would be the one thing uh, that, that would make me more comfortable with this is if whatever license fee we choose, it is appropriate for the cost the city would be bearing. That would be my criteria for this. Thank you. And I think by statute, any fee that is implemented has to be validated by staff time or cost to the municipality. Councilor Johnson, questions? Yes, thank you. I have uh, a few questions, yes. Um, I believe that tobacco use has fallen to the lowest that it has since they've been recording, is that correct? That's what I understand. Did we find that statistic? I'm not sure. Maybe cigarette use. The cigarettes, use. but we were looking could you, could you, at, at the vaping and the new electronic cigarettes because that's what is enticing the youth. And since our project was really directed at youth, it was more into the e-cigarettes. Okay. Um, is there actually any solid data that licensing is affecting usage? Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> so with just preliminary, uh, what the Jeffco Public Health, uh, when they, um, I believe they surveyed some of the golden retailers afterwards to see what, uh, um, how that program worked in golden. And? And it did. Um, it, it, in golden, their numbers were, were awesome. Um, they really had a severe reduction in the youth purchasing of tobacco. I'm not sure exactly how they measured that, but they did have some really good statistics after the first year. Okay, because I noticed that Golden, Edgewater, Aspen, and Fountain were all mentioned. What about some of the larger cities in the state? We've got that seven cities were um, looked at out of how many? Do we know? The statistics are just from the ones that had gone through the licensing program. And that's the only, where, that's the only place we could get any, any data 
was the ones that had already started licensing it to see what success they had had. Okay, so only seven cities in the state have licensed, correct? Um, I think it's nine. Nine cities in the state right. have licensed. Okay. Um, somebody mentioned that there is no statewide licensing. I thought, is that accurate? There is no statewide licensing for e-cigs. For cigarettes, for tobacco. There isn't any statewide licensing. There's compliance checks, but there isn't a statewide license. You just purchase a, a license to sell from your local jurisdiction. Okay. Um, the gentleman from the retail, um, the attorney, he, you mentioned that you'd like to see the retailers have a seat at the table to help with any policy. What kind of things would you like to see included or not included? What What is it that, have the other cities included you or not? Or is that fair to ask? So in your preliminary research, you had industry. Did you have industry? I th thought I saw that in your report. So we surveyed a few businesses in the Lakewood area, just some oh. general questions about what type of products they sell, what percentages of, um, of their sales are tobacco related, um, and what they thought about retail licensing, but it was a very small sampling. Okay. <coughs> Ms. Johnson, uh, for right. example, Fountain has an ordinance which they've adopted that prohibits uh, any um, self-sales of products. Our business is age-restricted. You can't come into our store unless you're 18 years old to begin with. Signs are posted on the door to begin with. So that type of ordinance, for example, would make no sense in our store because the very basis of the store is to allow uh, adults to come in, touch and feel the products to decide what it is they want to buy. So that ordinance, for example, doesn't make sense in, in our uh, business model. So there's an example where had, had we been consulted prior to the adoption of that ordinance, it would have made more sense. Uh, I can't begin to imagine what the city council would uh, discuss, but certainly uh, you know, that's one example. That's an example, okay. Um. And another speaker spoke about the concentration of the liquids in the vapes. How is that monitored and how is that done? I'm curious. I don't think it is. I, I don't think you know exactly how much is in here. I don't have my glasses on, but it's, it doesn't say how much is in here. So, so, all right, up, 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 up. we're not going to go from the gallery. So the idea is before this completely spins, the recommendation is to have council look at going to the next step of having a discussion. This would be part of that discussion, just like our trash uh, or our recent sh grocery cart ordinance. We brought in the industry and I imagine that this would be the s a similar type deal. I think the community has talked and most up here realize that our tobacco stores, some of them, you have to be 18 or older, so you would be exempt. So this is just a preliminary presentation on research with a recommendation to come back to city council. Okay, so I all of that would be in play. I still have a few more questions. All right, I'm going to go to some other people so they can ask some questions. I'm not done with my question. Okay, Councillor Vincent. Um, maybe this is not the right time. I was just going to recommend that we move forward with a study session yeah. on the tobacco products. We have some good questions and we could have some more there. Councillor Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. Um, apologize, Ramey. I, I, I still have questions. Uh, I'll come back. I just, I have one or two, three questions. I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to participate. And my questions are maybe aren't even ones that can be answered tonight, but I just want to kind of get them out there. So when we talk about the first recommendation, which is promoting educational efforts, um, 
did do any of those the a and b which is course expand the breathe breathe easy and get involved with the protect our youth efforts etc are any of those um, educational efforts requiring funding that we need to consider? Because I know that you had option later for the $350,000, but if that turns out that it's subject to TABOR, if that was your only reasoning, are there funding components? And maybe we can't answer tonight, but it's going to be important to know, are there things that we can invest money in? Are they looking for space on our website? What would be those promotional things and which ones come with a cost component? Do you have any of that off the top of your head or just more food for thought we had looked at it more of volunteers there's a lot of volunteerism in our city and looking at volunteers to help getting those programs going help those the youth um, organize talk amongst themselves help them organize I think we were looking at it more as volunteers rather than money I don't know that throwing money at this is that helpful I think it's grassroots Okay, and and also it'd be something for us to consider from a staff component if there needs to be kind of a, a staff component to kind of help guide people towards those things or to, for us to look for volunteers. So I think that's important just to know what we're, how we can make education effective and not just say we're promoting it, but what are the action steps to actually have a promotion that actually does what it's intended to do. Um, the second one I had was, was the only reason on the licensing of the non-cigarette tobacco products, did you guys pick that one because of the funding? Is that the only reason it was picked? Because it says on the other one that it would send a stronger message. And if we're trying to send a stronger message, if that were to be the, the consensus of the goal, then was it just the money that drove you towards option A? It was twofold. Well, yeah, twofold. So one is definitely the tax revenue and the implications, but the other was that we thought you would achieve the same results essentially by doing the uh, non-cigarette tobacco uh, retailers, since most of them sell both products. But that's discussion for you popular. about Ab what kind of message you want to. Absolutely. And um, I, I've just been, uh, since you guys sent out the packet, which had a ton of great information, I do appreciate it. It really talked about, you know, a threefold approach of that people are doing implementing smoke free laws, raising tobacco prices, which of course comes with a whole host of discussion, and then increase funding for tobacco control programs. And that's where you kind of have to look at that prong as well. So thank you. Great. Councilor Skilling. I thought I heard during the um, presentation that there was a 76% reduction where non-cigarette tobacco licensing is in place. Wasn't Did I mishear that number? I don't think we said that. I think you read that on the chart that's in our old. Oh. I think it might have been those folks in the back. 76%? And you should see some of those figures in the chart that was in the, the research that we put together. And um, <clears throat> the actual recommendations that we're talking about just generally to move this on to the next phase is we do a license. We have a fee with that license. It's $250 or maybe more. We then use that money for enforcement of the license. And we also use it for the education programs that you listed out here. I have that pretty much in a nutshell. My final question, you might not know the answer, but the 350000 that we get from the state that we would lose, remember that if we go with the full-blown option, is that money used specifically for education or treatment, or how do we use the three fifty? Is it just That's whatever we want? Fund. Got it. Thank you. All right, nobody else. Councillor Johnson, please. The floor is yours for everything else. Well, thank you. Um, I noticed that the, uh, the compliance, basically, in all of the cities is through the police department, correct? Has our police department weighed in on this? We did not. We did not go to them to ask um, for any input from them. We did not think that was our place. We're looking at just deterring youth from smoking. So how the city chooses to handle this is up to you folks. Okay. Can I interrupt, um, Councillor Johnson? We sure. did get 
um, feedback from our police chief as it relates to enforcement and what those costs might be. And if indeed this does go to a study session, that would be something we would bring back to you to look at. Whether that's um, an enforcement through the police department, we talk about what those costs are and what those available resources are. We know that um, we, we struggle um, hiring and, and retaining police officers. Another option might be similar to our um, our liquor inspections through our city clerk's office. That that's that's um, those are the options that we would offer to you, and then the fiscal implications of both. So the police department's concern, to be real direct, is is in terms of enforcement and available resources. But there may be some other options. Thank you. Um, I too was looking at some of the cost that was for other cities it was 117 to 188 to do two checks a year correct okay and um, also when you continued looking on the chart it didn't look like that was actually enough money to cover that kind of a thing you're correct it's not enough money so the fee then would have to be much higher than that yes okay um, I'm just curious, at this point, it sounds like CDPHE, Colorado Department for Public Health and Environment, is doing the enforcement at the state level, correct? And how many enforcers do they have? Do we know? I don't know. I don't know. I did speak with one, and he had traveled up to the metro area from Colorado Springs. I don't imagine they have too many. Because it sounded like they only were able to survey 50% of the retailers, but we don't know how many enforcers they have. Um, I really applaud the BE program at Lakewood, and I'd very much like to see that expanded to the other high schools. I think education is the, the answer for this. Um, let's see here. Also, was it Amendment 72 that went down by 54%? Yep. Correct? We're a tag team. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it was. Thank you. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so if we, I'm just throwing things out there. If we have a fee for um, licensing, that cost will be passed down to the consumer. Will that drive uh, consumption to the internet or the black market? Is there any kind of information on that kind of a thing? We if didn't, you know, it's so new in Colorado for the cities that we did research. I, I don't think there's any data on that yet. Okay. Because I believe that the money from CDPHE comes from the tobacco litigation, correct? I think so. I believe so. It, it, that's an interesting thing. I was down at the state house about that time, and the state had a tremendous windfall from that money. And I clearly remember a legislator speaking at the mic that she wanted that money, some of it diverted to education so kids could read the labels on cigarettes. So anytime you have a windfall of money, everybody wants to get their hands on it. Um, Do we have any idea um, what the potential impact would be for the point of sale strategies? You know, I don't was, think we didn't look at that at all, did we? We really didn't. We were really concentrating on how to focus on those 18 year olds, less than 18 year olds. Okay. Well, I know that this is a very complicated situation. 
I grew up in a home with a dad that smoked and a stepmother that did, and I never did. And I'm not sure why some people can be around cigarette smoke and choose not to, and other people are not around it and choose to smoke. There's something there that I haven't connected the dots to yet, and I don't know that I don't know that there's been research on that. Um, I guess that's it. I this probably should go to a study session, but I have a lot of questions. I have concerns, frankly, legislating people's behavior and um, what the parental responsibility is here. You know, it's hard for me to think that if your child's got vapes that you don't understand what's going on. And somehow that educational piece needs to expand to the parents. They have, they need to come to the table on this as well. So. All right, any other questions? All right, so let's get uh, any comments and we'll see if we can move forward. I would just say, I think the goal for me, and I think you nailed it, I appreciate the presentation, all the input. Um, we're looking at youth and trying to do everything we can to protect our youth. And adults have a different opportunity. I started smoking when I was 14. Luckily, I quit when I was 21, but I love to smoke. And I know that if I had one cigarette, I'd be smoking again. So I, I, I understand that it's real. We heard about it, you know, tonight starting at 12, 13. We want to try to stop and set the trajectory for healthy kids the best we can. And we have that opportunity. And I think there's a way we can do this moving forward to staff to, to deal with a lot of the questions we heard tonight, to bring in the industry to look at best practices and really look at being uh, taking this on as a team effort. So that is what I would like to see. And uh, we will look for consensus. Councilor Gutwein. Thank you. Um, I just really want to thank everyone who has been involved in this for so long. Um, and the continued effort from both our community and all the different stakeholders of it that have gotten involved. Um, and also ACIC who did such tremendous research. This is just such high quality level of research. It's a really complicated issue. Um, so can't thank you enough. And then also the industry um, people that need, everyone has to be at the table in order to come up with something that's gonna work. And I think one of the coolest things to me through this is hearing from you guys like, I want to see a licensing in place because we already follow this. We already make sure that our stores aren't selling to kids and we want to make sure that everybody else is following the same rules. Um, that's just really, uh, I, I just applaud you um, so much for uh, the work that you're doing to prevent um, youth, youth tobacco use. Um, so I, I definitely support moving this forward to staff and, and addressing some of these key pieces. Uh, again, I think we, we all agree that we're talking about youth tobacco. We don't want to, you know, adults are, they get to make their own decisions. Let's not go there. That's up to them. But the youth tobacco prevention. Um, and then, you know, I appreciate the ACIC's recommendation and it makes sense to me to, to do the non-tobacco licensing. Um, the research shows that that's effective. It reduces like we said, 76% or 70, I wrote 74. He says 76. It's one of the two um, of the illegal sales uh, reduction. Um, and the things that I would really want to look at is making sure that, you know, we have our financial understanding of making sure that the fees are going to cover the cost of the program. And it looks like it's in the vicinity of the $300. Um, $300 annual fee. And then it's also really important to me that we look at these options of having the city clerk's office similar to the way we do our alcohol licensing um, because of all, you know, we are all very familiar with uh, the stresses on our police department right now. And we, I want to be supportive. I think we all do um, and know that there's a lot of other pressing issues that they have. So uh, it sounds like there's other cities that have done programs this way that are equally effective. Um, so I do really want to move this forward um, and and nail down those specifics and, and make sure that everyone is at the table and ensuring um, that 
everyone has a chance to weigh in on the important matters. And I'm looking directly to uh, the people who came here from the industry. So thank you guys. Uh, and we'll make sure that everyone is at the table and hope that we can all move this forward. So thank you. Councilor Abel. Uh, as I've said before, when uh, I was younger and the time came for me to decide whether to smoke or not, the only thing that stood in our way was that it would stunt your growth. <laughs> uh, I think the edu because of that, the education component is vital. I chose to go ahead and smoke, and I regret it to this day. And uh, eight years after quitting, it still bothers me every day. The education component is primary. Um, also, I'd like to second Dana, our Councilwoman Gutwine, on alternative enforcement. Uh, perhaps we can find something that is less consuming for our sworn officers. Thank you. And thank you to the uh, folks who are promoting a healthier lifestyle for our kids. Okay, so is there a consensus to move, uh, Councilor Bita? Yeah, one, one second. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Uh, let me just say it looks like we have a consensus in the community that we've got a, an issue here, a problem that needs addressing. People are concerned about it, so this sounds like a good way to at least address it. Thank you for the from the commission for nice work, really nice work, and I I, I would agree. Let's let's move it forward. At least let the our uh, staff take a look at it and see see what their thoughts are thank you so is that consensus on that all right uh, miss Hodson do you need any clarification on the moving forward or is there enough in the report to start to build off of yeah thank you I believe there's enough in the report that we can talk at the staff level and come up with some good alternatives for you all to deliberate um, especially around like we discussed the enforcement issue um, the fee issue which would be subject to Tabor by the way um, and um, whatever else is in the report so we'll throw that around and schedule that and uh, let you know if there are more questions I think we're in good shape thank you okay I think that's where we'll go. So thank you to everybody that came out. Continue to stay uh, in tune and active. I know you will, so that's good. And uh, we look forward to coming out with a nice product that's going to uh, preserve the rights of those who want to indulge and are able with age and help our kids. So find that nice balance. Ms. Duffy, and you're on the public comment roster, so I don't know if you just should just stay up here the whole night or what. Presentation two. Yes, part two. The easy one ish. Yes. I heard it wasn't easy. Is that what I heard? Yeah. It wasn't. <laughs> How do I get back to what's in a name? Thank you, ma'am. Technical difficulties. Next presentation is an ad hoc committee that the Advisory Commission for an Inclusive Community did. And this came out of the volunteerism recommendations that uh, most of you saw some time ago. It, we have so many people in Lakewood that, that want to volunteer and there's so many opportunities for them. So um, one of the committees took a look at that and one of the things they found was that the Advisory Commission for an Inclusive Community, no one really knew what we did. And then, unfortunately, it was shortened to the ACIC. Invariably in your ward meetings, you said, well, the ACIC and somebody piped up and said, what's that? Well, of course, ACIC didn't mean anything to the citizens. So here is a grassroots proposal that we came up with, and we did some research on what this commission should be called and what we really do. 
we didn't have a mission statement. And as you all know, but maybe the audience doesn't know, we're a group of volunteers, of citizens, from the entire city of very diverse backgrounds, diverse areas, and we all come together and we help you to do research, such as the youth tobacco, so that you don't have to spend your time looking at all that. It's something else that takes some of this off the plate of, of some of the staff. So we looked at all of that and decided that since there was no clear understanding, we looked at what the other commissions were called. They're all short and to the point. Planning Commission, who doesn't know what they do? Board of Adjustment, Historic Preservation. This was the easy part of our, our job this way. Lakewood Advisory Commission. It's very simple, it's to the point. When you say Advisory Commission, people are gonna have a better understanding of what we do. We advise. We don't make any decisions, we just do the research and then advise. The harder part of our assignment was the mission statement. Now this is where the 30 people on this commission had some fun. <laughs> it took a while. We all had different ideas about who we are and what we do. So we had brainstorming sessions and really called out those words such as inclusive community, which was important as part of our name, but that's not who we are. It's more of what we do making Lakewood an com uh, inclusive community. So we came up with this. It's a bit longer than we would like, but it really says our mission. In order to support Lakewood as a vibrant and inclusive community, the Lakewood Advisory Commission is an advocate and informed voice for the community by providing research and recommendations on local issues to the city council. And we felt that was a real clear definition of what we're trying to do for you. And that's it. Here's our team members. It was short and to the point. We had just a few, few team members on this, but let me tell you, the 30 people on the commission all had their say a couple of times. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to the commissioners who are here as well. So let's start with questions. Councilor Beatum. Just one question. Did you consider Citizens Advisory Commission as opposed to Lakewood? We and did. If, and why did you decide against that? We did. Because there's such a connotation right now in our nation regarding citizens, we decided not to put that in there. We wanted to just make it Lakewood. Thank you. Th thanks for asking, though. Councilor Gutwein, question? Just a simple question, which is, if we decide to move this forward, is this just a, something that we would just vote on to adopt, or does it then go back to you to? So we would direct staff to produce an ordinance. Yes, and that's the ordinance accurate. Would then change. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, no questions, comments. So I would just start with, um, well done. I certainly understand. I mean, I think it took me two or three years on council to remember ACIC just in and of itself. I do appreciate the intent. I think it's so important to say an advisory commission for an inclusive community. I've really learned how important an inclusive community is to our residents. So it's, you know, bittersweet to see that go, but I certainly understand and I appreciate the inclusion of, of the mission statement. I don't think it's too long. Mission statements can be super challenging. I think this council spent a few years in a row at retreats trying to hash something out. So we gave up, but <laughs> well done to you and your group. So I certainly will be supporting this. Thank you, Councilor Vincent. Um, just, just one quick comment. Um, as someone who does the interviews for this committee, I appreciate changing the name because you start out and you get really tongue-tied on ACIC and the explanation, and, and I um, really like the mission statement also. And 
just as a side note, because I never talk about this, but as someone who's facilitated C, C groups through mission statements, the idea that you got 30 people to agree to it is <laughs> astounding. <laughs> I'm, I'm flabbergasted, can you tell? So good job. And I'd like to move it forward. Elsa Gouin. I agree with what everyone said here, and I, I certainly support doing this. And uh, I think that it will help people understand what I know I'm going to what the ACIC does, but um, what the Lakewood Advisory Commission do, will, will do. And I appreciate that. I like also that it, the inclusive community was kept in the mission statement. And uh, and I was on ACIC with a couple of you. And uh, I I know this was a lot of work to get through and um, to get everyone on board. And I think it's just really well done. So thank you for all the effort and all the conversations and all the work you guys do. Thanks. Elsa Johnson. Diane, I love your mission statement. Job well done. Thank you. All right. Consensus to move forward. I imagine that's crystal clear. Thank you. Thank you all for your work. And you have a lot of work ahead of you, actually. There's a lot of stuff going. And this is a nice segue before we go into public comment. We have an update from our RTD director, uh, Natalie Menton, District M. And while she's coming down, the AC, the advisory commission, dang it, made a recommendation to council about looking into the lights on the bridge on 6th Avenue, timely for our rep. So they are going to take that on, and hopefully we can figure out how to get those lights back on. Right. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Natalie Menton, Ward 5, and also RTD Director, uh, Lakewood Golden Wheat Ridge Area. Um, so every three years we do a fair review, and it is that time of year again where uh, our time a cycle, in our cycle, that we're going to review the fares. So how do I get the... Can we please turn on the... Here? Here? Yep, you're right. No, you were right first. And is it upside down? Over here. Perfect. Can you flip it? Boom. Okay, so I'm going to try to go through this very quickly because you're already into a long evening. Um, first is just a reminder on how RTD is funded. So let's start with that real quick. As you'll see, and there are spare flyers on the back table, if anybody would like to grab one of those. RTD's main source of funding comes through sales and use tax. Uh, you may be a little bit surprised, as you've heard figures over the years, that fares cover 20% of the cost of service. In reality, it is 12%. So fares cover a very little portion. The big pieces of the pie that you'll see on that chart there is that sales tax covers 52%. And the next largest chunk is gas taxes, which many people think you're, when you fuel up and you pay money to the feds on your gas taxes, and ironically, and I have quite an issue actually with this, um, when it goes into the National Highway Trust Fund, um, one would think that that meant it went into a trust fund to go to roads, but it's actually going to cover things like transit. So as we have a very um, good discussion this fall with a ballot coming up on should we increase money going to the roads, where is the money, mon money going right now? Um, okay, so I'll stop on that part. So passenger fares cover 12%. Advertising cost, uh, covers about 2%. So I think I gave a pretty good chart right there as to showing you what funds are TD. Another key part I included on this flyer that I made custom up for the Jeffco is our TD ridership there. You're going to see that after the West Line opened, ridership has continued to drop in the RTD system. So for the investment put in, it is not producing the ridership that it was. Uh, why is that? Shared ride services have taken a, filled a hole that was needed by the private sector and it's actually done it quite well. If you look down, go downtown, you will see people, of course, all the time jumping into a car that's there within a few minutes of them asking for it. And they pay a very low fare to get where they need to go and it goes door to door. 
So I really appreciate the industry, actually. So before I jump into the fairs too much, let me state I'm just giving you a brief preview tonight. And there will be a meeting in Lakewood uh, where you can come and get into a little more discussion if you would like. And you could share that with your constituents. So that one that will be in Lakewood is at the Clements Community Center at 1580 Yarrow Street right off Colfax. And that's Thursday, July 19th, 6 to 8 p.m. If I'm allowed to have charcoal, I might cook hot dogs out front for all of you, if you would like. But I'm checking with the fire department on that first. I keep trying to do that. All right, again, I'm gonna go through this very briefly. Where we've gotten to this point is that for a year, there was a past program working group who studied our fairs and came up with recommendations, much like a citizen's advisory committee. Um, and what they came up with, um, along with our budget department and many others, is three different options. And the timeline we're looking at, looking at these, is we're gonna hold our public meetings in July, and then in the August, September timeframe, this will come before our RTD committee, um, our Operations Customer Service Committee, and then move to the full board for approval. So where this all started was when we had our fare increase three years ago, um, there are certain individuals who carry an eco pass, which is a pass that's bought by an employer, and it's an insurance type model, in that let's say you have 300 employees and 25 of them use RTD, the employer was buying 300 passes for those individuals. There's a mix of the private sector and some government agencies that use the EcoPass. Uh, for some companies, it's really a, a comp it's not a, uh, they don't have a return on the investment, let's put it that way. Um, some have better usage. So when we all started on this, uh, uh, inspection of the fair program a year ago they really were to stick with what do the fair programs in the past programs look like how do we adjust those because RTD policy is to increase the fares I don't know any other time we've really gone all the other way is to inspect the fares every three years um, so as this committee started to look through this they came through with option one which is no fare increase at all that would not meet our strategic budget if we went with option two, you would see an increase on a local one way, assuming it's somebody on a regular fare, not a senior or a student age six to 19 who's discounted. So I'm just gonna stick with the regular passenger. Uh, it would go from $2.60 to $2.90. If it's a regional, goes 450 up to $5. You can continue to see that other changes. One of note there, is with the EcoPass, which is that insurance program I told you about, that would go to a utilization price programming. Right now, those who pay the 50% fare include seniors 65 and older, those who are disabled on Medicare, or students age 6 to 19, kids 5 and younger with an adult ride free. <coughs> You'll notice that on um, option two, this would also change it so that youth would pay 30% of the full fare versus the 50% they're at right now. Option three changes it to where you'll see more of a increase in the fare, and that is because this committee looked at adding in a low-income pass program. The background on the RTD Low Income Pass Program is that about three years ago, we, RTD District and the taxpayers were providing, because it is taxpayer money all the way around, they're at the top of our organizational chart. Uh, the taxpayers were funding um, approximately 5 million, I forget the 5.3 million, um, in low income passes we would provide to nonprofit organizations. They had to do the income verification. We're not gonna do that. They decided how they dispense them. So that might be, as an example, Jeffco Action Center or uh, Jefferson County uh, Workforce Program. That would be examples. About three years ago, we increased that to $6.8 million. So, yeah. Um, and 
the money's not free. It doesn't, it, you know, it's, it doesn't grow in a tree in the back. So it's going to come from somewhere. So in option three, that means individuals will be paying a higher rate to pay for the low income program. Now I showed you ridership. If we bump riders or if we bump fares too much, we are going to trigger a loss. So this is a good discussion to have with the community. And I'll let you know, uh, just because many of you probably just don't know this off the top of your head, but Lakewood, all of Lakewood stations, actually, it's not Red Rock, so, but Wadsworth Station, Garrison, Oak Street, those are all within a local fare. But on the West Line, Golden is the higher rate. It's a regional. So that's even a bigger hit. And when you take 20 minutes, 20 at the most, 25, uh, to drive downtown, and it's going to cost $5.25, more people will get in their car. But the other hand, the first part I started out is right now fares are covered by 12% for the fare. So you can see where it's an interesting discussion. At least I find it interesting. There will be some other advantages. Those are noted um, on the one page where uh, one of the things I do like the most is replacing a three-hour one-way transfer with a three-hour any way you want to go. So if you just went to the doctor and it, or chiropractor weekly and it takes you you know, half hour to get there, you got an hour appointment, come back home, and you can do it within the three hours, this will actually be less money than where we're at right now. So um, I will, again, share that um, there's pamphlets in the back for anybody who would like them. Um, I did set up these meetings special. We were only going to have one in Jefferson County. I didn't think that was adequate. So uh, I worked with... Uh, Peggy Catlin, who's the new board director for the mountains and south area. And if anybody cannot make the Lakewood meeting, there's also one in Evergreen on Sunday, July 15th. And Southwest Jeffco, and that one I know I'm cooking chili. So, you know, if you really want to, I do make it a little bit hot. But um, anybody's welcome to do that. And they can also just go to our website. They don't have to go to one of these meetings, although we always love to see people chime in, whether they're a writer or not, because I've illustrated taxpayers' money is funding this in a big way, even if they're not a writer. So that's it. I don't know how long I took, but hopefully it was pretty short. No, you did great. So you're going to have a couple questions. Alrighty. So I have Councillor Harrison. Um, thank you. Turn on your mic, please. Uh-oh. I thought I turned it on. Um, excellent presentation. But on, on the funding sources, you talk about both bus and rail. But on fares, that's just rail, correct? Light rail? That's bus and rail. Bus and rail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th thank you. Yes, I will add, though, um, let's say as an example, you were out at the Jeffco Government Center mm -hmm. and you got on the W line. That would be considered regional. You could jump on a bus, go along Colfax, and in some ways, in some ways, get better transit actually, and it would be the local fare. Where do we learn all those little secrets? There's got to be a class. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Councilor Vincent. Um, one question: Option three, I see what what happened to adults or seniors. Seniors will stay the same. And so I did note that because I knew when I copied it. So if you look on this green bar at the bottom I inserted, um, the 50% discount would remain available for local, regional, and airport. Do you see the green one at the bottom here? All right. Because it looks like an option three if you just compare all these that seniors fell off. Yeah, I copied and pasted from the staff, and then after a third version of printing this, I go, I bet I'm going to get that question. So <laughs> I inserted it on the green bar. And then one, just one other quick thing, um, your RTD ridership, mm -hmm. and you said the W line from December 2016 to November 2017. Did this ridership, should this ridership include also the opening of the R, the L, and one other one? 
This is system ridership. So it is it system. Does, does okay. include the R line is um, having some pretty big problems, and there is a tremendous amount of outreach. But um, in some ways, it suffers like the W line that it's a slow trip. Yeah. But it is all included in there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Councilor Bida. Just a, one question: Do you have any average number or average percent of the? ridership per bus per vehicle system-wide in other words half full average 25 75 percent do you have anything like that are you talking about vehicle capacity yeah as of vehicle capacity sure boy that can get all over the place i mean you can have packed um 16 running down colfax right. and you can have buses running around empty right. in other parts of the system and that that's why I'm asking for sort of an average yeah and you know I've asked many times I mean should we be buying 40-foot buses should we be buying um, the articulated with a stretchy um, and I think we're gonna get in that discussion again um, because there are lots of the parts of the system where we're running a huge vehicle around which does create more traffic congestion right. um, and just for system-wide I'll share with you that about still Six high 60 almost 70 percent of our riders are on bus the remainder on rail All right, thank you. You're welcome Councillor Franks um, I had a question about the utilization pricing of like the eco passes um, You were mentioning that most businesses maybe don't get the value out of that um, so obviously that will be a reduction if you go to this model it'll be a reduction in funds coming from them with that so that'd be correct but then are there any plans for outreach to kind of try to fill in for the businesses that surround maybe areas that have lower ridership as an ins another incentive that they can offer to their employees which you know maybe you're going to the ball game or you're you know you're not going to ride it a lot but it would encourage you to get out of the car a few times are there plans to augment off what you're losing in the utilization Utilization pricing uh, yes and we are waiting for some final numbers so when we do have this liquid um, meeting I will have some more details there are going to be parts of the system but probably more along the boulder line where they will see an increase in their cost they are getting we would consider a heck of a deal based on their user their ridership so it will be a mix but really for some areas in Lakewood uh, the eco pass would be really a heck of a deal and I think probably the best plan would be a partnership with Lakewood on those within the business districts a lot of the Fed Center already uses them I hope that answered your question and will you have some at that meeting if I'm not able to attend will you have some numbers that we can can share or anything that you can share because I think it like I said it's a good benefit for folks it's another way to reduce uh, trips on the road for those activities that can have a point A to point B destination rather than errand running or that type of thing so if there's any numbers you can give let me know I will we will have more of those we'll also be changing the zones we call them SLAs uh, service areas there will be some changes there and that should all be ready by July 16th I was a bit anxious to start the outreach because three cities sometimes you have the meetings same nights and um, trying to cover a lot of places as I said adding meetings even here in July so that we get as much input as possible and um, I know I will have more information for you Councilor Johnson Thank you. Nice presentation, Natalie. I have kind of an odd observation. <coughs> the times that we have been going south on I-25, and I know that's not part of what you're talking about here, the light rail runs every seven minutes on a Sunday morning, and generally there might be one or two people per train. Has there ever been any thought that in those times of days on certain days like a Sunday morning when the ridership is down to um, to have the amount of trains kind of go along with what the need is it just seems odd to have them every seven minutes and they're empty yeah um, I would see if you're talking about the C and D line along Santa Fe ENF on, along I-25 is, is what you said 25 right. um, I would have to answer on this 
on each Sunday that that might apply, frankly. If we set out a run and it's going out at six in the morning or, or probably more likely four or five in the morning, but we have a Rockies game at say 11, then we really need to set up that train to allow for that. Uh, exa great example of many buses running around most of the day almost empty, but in the peak, you'll see that. So it, it, it can change, there can be reasons for it, but uh, it's something that we always do wanna try to see, just like the W line adjusting from two cars to three cars, and we'll now start to get some complaints that people have to stand. <clears throat> but honestly, our service planners, we're not gonna add on more until it is standing packed more and more, so people aren't guaranteed a seat. I, I don't know if that answered what you were looking for. I've just never seen it full on a Sunday morning. Generally, we we go down to Colorado Springs occasionally, usually about 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's never full, never. So I just thought if there's a way to adjust the time of day on certain days of the week. I'm just curious, that's all. Yeah, it's. Um, I would say if I asked a planner what they would be talking about is with that scheduling, if we were running a different, there's so many different things that um, a schedule runs off of, meetings, m meeting and getting a transfer and all those things. And if you start to switch it up, it just can really create a headache. You you know what you're doing far better than I don't know about that, but okay. <laughs> Councilor Gutwein. Game day is always packed of notice too. Um, thank you. And I just had a quick question about the neighborhood eco pass. So we have a lot of, we have the sustainable neighborhoods program um, in Lakewood. And I was just wondering if you could give kind of a brief intro of what that is, um, because I'm not sure that our community is, is aware of it. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll without trying to sound biased, I would say that there's a good reason why we probably don't because it's very difficult to work within. What you'd have to think of, you're ver probably very familiar with what a precinct mm -hmm. roughly looks like. What you would have to do, somebody in that neighbor would first have to have an HOA or somebody who's gonna be able to cut a check, one check. They're gonna have to go to all of those neighbors in the same way with a insurance type model you would have to have enough buy-in from all of those neighbors to kick in the money to get past the minimum that we need, which is usually a few thousand dollars, several thousand dollars. Then you have to go through and do a survey of the entire neighborhood. And what you have to do is figure out how much each person uses RTD. Because RTD's philosophy is we are not going to price it out less than what your usage is because then we have to put more drivers on the road. So then they form this, they have come back with these surveys, find out somebody who's insured to write that check, and honestly, I don't know how many neighborhoods would buy in to do all of that. I, I'd have to agree with your assessment on that one. Thank you. You're welcome. Director Mann, thank you very much. Thanks for all you do, I know you always try to get it out in the community and you work uh, to get things on channel eight as well. So if there's anything that we can help with this information, please let us know to get that out to our people. Hot dogs and chili. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is the point in the meeting where the public is invited to address the city council on items that did not appear on the agenda. All comments should be directed to the city council. I ask all that are left in attendance, please observe the decorum of the city council chambers. Refrain from applause or audible support or discord with the speaker. Again, three minutes, two and a half, it'll go yellow. At your end, it will go red. And before I start to call names, the council members from Ward 5 wanted to address an issue that we'll probably hear about in public comment. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to read, first of all, an email that uh, many of us have received from Jenna Mountain. Um, what we're talking about is the house located at 1619 Lee Street. Um, and Jenna uh, and Paul, her husband, have been um, heavily impacted by this situation. And um, I'm gonna read her email. They were not able to be here this evening, but ask that this be read into the record. 
To Mayor Adam Paul and Lakewood City Council, we are unable to attend the Lakewood City Council meeting tonight, but would be remiss if we didn't take the opportunity to voice our disapproval of the status and the progress of the rat infestation at 1619 South Lee Street. Although we've had noted efforts have been made um, to exterminate the rats, the city has not ensured the cleanup and restoration of the property in a timely manner. Extermination of the rats is only an initial step as the house is full of dead rats is not much better than a house full of live rats. We demand to be provided a timeline so we can understand exactly when the home will be cleaned up and restored to acceptable conditions. We understand the deadline for the homeowners to appeal the notice of, un of the unsafe, unlivable structure is July 20th, 2018, and the building department can set a date for compliance of cleaning and restoring the home once the date has passed, if no appeal has occurred. The notice posted on June 20th, 2018 also provides that the city of Lakewood may cause the structure to be repaired to the extent necessary to correct the conditions which render the building unsafe or dangerous. What date does the city intend to set for the cleanup or restoration following the passing of the July 20th deadline? The city must step in immediately following the passing of the July 20th deadline and cause the structure to be repaired. The owners of 1619 South Lee Street have been long aware of the issue and clearly have no regard for their fellow neighbors as they are taking the minimal required steps to remedy the situation. They abandoned their home and left the neighbors to deal with the problem they caused and never once cooperated with neighbors of the city of Lakewood or the city of Lakewood until forced to do so by a warrant. It is negligent, irresponsible, and immoral for the city of Lakewood to allow the owners of 1619 South Lee Street to prolong cleanup and restoration at the expense and the suffering of the entire neighborhood. We demand that the city of Lakewood step in to restore the home at 1619 South Lee Street as soon as humanly possible in order to protect our neighborhood and your city. Signed, Paula and Jenna Mountain. Paul and Jenna Mountain. Um, I just wanted to add to their remark that both Dana and I um, stopped by the Mountain home um, today, and their concern is genuine. When you step out on their patio, you can smell the smell of dead rats. Um, and they have a, a nine-month-old child in the home that they're very concerned about. This is a horrible situation. None of us believe and that we live in a ghetto of any sort or um, would even think that we'd have this kind of situation. Um, and, and I would just say that I think the mountains are very reasonable people. Um, they are living through a nightmare and um, I think would be willing to support almost anything that we can do to try to help them. So I will, in my comments there and Dana do you want to add something just a couple additional things um and and like Karen said I me and my kids stopped by at Jenna's house today and I just really feel for the situation that they're in and relate to her as a young mom moving to the this house and starting their life and then dealing with this nightmare of a situation um so just really appreciate all the effort that's um, been put in. And I wanted to, I think that the key thing now moving forward is maintaining good communication and getting um, clear answers on the timeline. Um, so I wanted to just update or read a quick update that we got from the chief and so that people know what is being done to address this. And then um, Karen and I want to have an an additional um, ward meeting because we've had we have a monthly meeting every every month and we haven't canceled in a really long time maybe a year and a half or two years but this was our planned cancel and it was a very bad timing um, so you know people want information understandably and so we're working with staff and thank you to um, our city manager for helping us make sure that we have the right staff in 
there at our meeting so that we can we can get more answers about this um, as we go. But again, uh, so here's here's what's happening now is that the pest control edge pest control is visiting the home three to four days a week, replacing the bait boxes, eliminating many of the entry exit sites. Um, the city paid edge pest control to place additional bait boxes around the property to expedite the extermination pro process. LPD animal control visits the home and neighborhood three to five times per day and removes um, the rats from the property. Uh, surrounding homes have been contracted with another pest control company um, at the city of Lakewood's expense to prevent any spread of the infestation. Um, and you know, basically, the, after the infestation is eliminated, um, the homeowners will contract with the home restoration company to address the remaining issues, smell, health con health issues, drywall. And I know that these are what a lot of the neighbors ha have remaining questions about is, you know, what's the timeline for that? Um, some of which we won't know until we, until the damage is assessed. Um, but so we will keep that information um, available to the community as as we have it. Um, and again, I just uh, really feel for our neighbors that are in this situation. Um, and as a council, I know that we'll all be looking for ways that we can prevent um, issues like that moving forward. So thank you to everyone who's been working hard to get this issue resolved for our neighbors. So thank you. All right, Ms. Kinney. Good evening. Good evening, thank you. Um, Dane and Karen, thank you. So I'm here to talk about the Rat House. And basically what you just addressed was a lot of what I was gonna ask you. Um, the most important thing right now is that we need to maybe not even call it a ward meeting, just have a meeting, um, just get out there for all the people in the neighborhood. And again, I'm not, I think you missed exactly where I live. I do not live on Lee Street. I'm off of Lee, St Lee Street and we are still impacted by it. Um, so 2018, it's the lost summer. We can't go outside. The odor is terrible, it's horrendous. Um, you can't entertain. You can't eat outside with your guests because you don't want the rats joining you for dinner. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not getting any better. You know, they may be doing stuff inside, but we're not seeing it yet. So if we can find out when and how, what additional steps are gonna take, that would be great. Um, I actually though had a couple questions for the city manager and the city attorney, is that? Just, just go ahead and direct them to us. And okay, all right. Um, so for the city attorney, I was curious if the people under her in the zoning department, and I think that they're under her because she referred to her position as the top position, so I'm thinking that they're under her. Um, do they have liability insurance? Have they been addressed and have they been, has this been addressed with them? And what is the accountability? As far as individually, as far as employees of the city of Lakewood, do they have liability insurance? Um, individual employees. Okay. The two that, I understand that there were a couple employees that didn't follow through with this in the past year. Um, so we'd just like to know where they're at and how it was addressed, um, if it has been addressed. Um, and then my second question was um, directed at the city um, attorney and Basically, I pulled up his CV today and it was like really impressive. Um, and so we know he went through a really difficult program to get his JD. Um, we know he's got the book smarts, but we need some action. And we need people to be creative to decide how they're gonna handle this. Because two weeks ago, we stood here and everybody was like, oh my God, this can't be happening. We've got to do something. And we were so excited when we left here. And here we are. We're still sleeping with our windows closed. And you know we're still paying extermination companies. Um, so if we can just kind of get those questions answered 
And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Duffy. Welcome. Thank you. On a more positive note, for those of you who did not attend the 4th of July celebration, it was awesome. I do want to thank Councillor Abel. He's the one that proposed this, that Lakewood have, again, a community um, summer festival with fireworks. The Advisory Commission researched it, and I have to say, community resources nailed the execution. It was it was a wonderful community event. Now, those fireworks were spectacular. Honestly, I went to Denver's the night before. Ours were way better, mm -hmm. way better. Twice as long and way better. But you know what was more important? The community spirit. I saw the kids running around. Okay, school's been out, what, three weeks? And they're, they acted like they hadn't seen each other in, you know, three months. Oh, hey. And there were neighbors talking to people that lived down the street. But they never talked. But they all met at Jeffco Stadium. It was a wonderful community event. So thank you to all of you, especially Councillor Abel. Great, thank you. Ms. George, good evening. You're back and I imagine it's not because you like to hang out <laughs> on Monday nights. I imagine you, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I hope y'all can hear this. Uh, two weeks ago, at the last city council meeting, I spoke to you about the excessive environmental noise produced by the Bristlecone shooting range. Mr. Mayor, you said that uh, you would have someone contact me, but to date, no one has. Uh, so this past Saturday, I went to the Ward 1 public meeting to speak directly with my representatives. Uh, Ramey Johnson directed me to Ward 3 Representative Pete Royball uh, and uh, said that he had some follow-up and some updates on the matter. Pete Royball then essentially proceeded to tell me to go pound sand. <laughs> Uh, he told me he had come out and taken decibel readings himself one day during peak shooting hours uh, on all four sides of the Bristlecone building with a phone app and didn't find any noise compliance issues. Uh, Mr. Roybal didn't mention what day he took his official readings or what criteria he used to determine peak hours at an indoor suburban shooting range. Uh, after a few minutes of listening to Mr. Roybal and unsuccessfully attempting to state my case, I said, so what you're telling me is that there's nothing the city of Lakewood can do about this problem. To which he replied, no, maybe you should take it up with the apartment management. They're the ones who decided to build an apartment complex next to a shooting range. You tipped your hand right then, Mr. Roybal, and I understood more clearly that this issue is about more than just excessive noise at a suburban shooting range. I would remind you, however, that the Lakewood City Council, along with the city manager and planning department, are solely responsible for all approvals and oversight of zoning, land use, and development in the city of Lakewood. So whatever bone you have to pick with the owners and developers of Beacon 85 property is between you and them. Your animosity toward them should not be taken out on the residents who live there, who had absolutely no part in the process or decision making regarding development and zoning in Union Square. <clears throat> that being said, regardless of what your very professional state-of-the-art phone app indicates about the noise levels at the Bristlecone shooting range, I hope this recording is helping better illustrate the real issue. As I tried to explain to Mr. Royball, it's not just the decibel level of noise, but the type of noise, the sustained, consistent sound of sharp, loud, vibrational noise on a daily basis is intrusive at best and maddening on the loudest days. In a public meeting with the planning department on June 4th, 2014, the owners of the Bristlecone spoke to the concerns about noise and identified how it would be minimized 
with fully grouted concrete block exterior walls, an interior baffle system, insulated exterior ducts, and additional sound attenuation material. They said that these systems would result in exterior noise levels of 10 to 15 decibels below the level of an ordinary side street. In reality, it is obviously much louder. In the follow-up Q&A during that meeting, Commissioner Dale Miller asked what the nature of the noise would be from the proposed shooting range, and the owner, Mr. Clark, said that there would be a, quote, muffled pop very near the building, but as the distance increases, the noise would be inaudible. I'm not sure how much distance he was alluding to, but the loud sounds of gunfire, gunfire can be clearly heard from more than 300 feet away from the Bristlecone building, and not only can it be heard over the quieter traffic in the area, it can be heard over the loudest traffic traffic in the area and over the loudest thunder in the area. From the Lakewood Municipal Code, Section 5, Offenses Against Public Peace, Title 9, Public Peace and Safety, Chapter 9.52, Noise. Declaration of Policy. It is declared that at certain levels, noise is detrimental to public health, comfort, convenience, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the city. This chapter is enacted to protect, preserve, and promote the health, welfare, peace, and quiet of the citizens of Lakewood through the reduction, prohibition, and regulation of noise. It is the intent of this chapter to establish and provide for the sound levels that will eliminate unreasonable and excessive noise, reduce community noise, promote a comfortable enjoyment of life, property, and conduct of business, and prevent sound levels which are physically harmful and detrimental to the individuals and the community. And so again, I ask the elected representatives of the city of Lakewood to please take this issue seriously and to take action to either require the owners of the Bristlecone shooting range comments. to install adequate soundproofing and to put an end to the environmental noise pollution their facility creates or revoke their permit to operate until they are able to do so. Hey, anybody else wish to speak? Yes, sir. Good evening, welcome for the record. Just get your name and address. Sure, good evening. I'm Stephen Buckley. I live at 1205 South Ingle Street, which is in Ward 3. Uh, my public comment this evening is inspired by uh, several conversations I've had with friends and neighbors and uh, people throughout Lakewood over the past year about growth. Um, I think it's no surprise that uh, growth has been perhaps the most contentious issue in our city for uh, a few years now. And it's a, it's a dirty word to a lot of folks. There's a lot of folks who say that, you know, we're sick and, and tired of it and uh, we just need to uh, stop it and slow it down. All it brings us is more, uh, you know, more uh, traffic, uh, more noise, um, you know, uh, more crowded schools and parks, you know, fears that it's going to, uh, you know, increase our taxes if we just allow more growth and development to happen. And there's a counter argument to that. There's, a, there's reasonable people, I think, who argue that, well, another uh, effect of the fact that the, our city and the Denver region is growing so quickly is that housing values are skyrocketing out of control, and we need to build a lot more housing if we want to contain that and maintain uh, the ability for uh, families like, uh, like my own, like most of the friends I know, like all my friends, uh, um, basically, except for me, all of our families are, are, that we know and are close to are renting. And every year, they're getting closer and closer uh, to being pushed out of the city, and many of them already have been. Um, and there's a counter-argument in this growth debate about that issue, too, that, you know, building more housing somehow doesn't solve it, that uh, supply and demand in the housing market is challenging, it's tricky, it's complicated, it's not so easy as just build more houses and, and housing values go down, right? You know, some of these new apartments that are being built around town have rents that start at two thousand dollars a month you know what middle class family is that affordable for for a two thousand dollar month and so there's this argument out there uh, that i've heard a lot that really intrigued me that building more housing doesn't really work to reduce housing costs because um, housing is just such an inherently complicated market and so i wondered is that is that true can i find data about that and so uh, i did some of my own research and i wanted to find some data to at least clarify that question because i think that one question there does building more housing reduce the cost of housing or not. Uh, I have a graph here that I put up here. Um, this is from, from Trulia.com. It's a real estate website uh, where you can you know, search for houses for sale anywhere in the country. And uh, there, 
uh, real estate experts and economists did a study. Uh, it was back in 2014 when they did this, but the data still largely applies. Uh, no expensive housing market builds much housing. So on the bottom, we see um, metropolitan areas across the country, uh, the number of houses they've built um, per 1,000 units from 1990 over the last uh, three decades, essentially. Uh, and on uh, the vertical axis, we have the uh, median asking price per square foot for houses that are for sale. So what this graph is telling us, um, in the bottom right corner there, we have some cities that have built lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of housing, and they're very inexpensive. Um, in the bottom left corner, we have some cities that haven't built much housing at all, and they're pretty affordable too. And then going straight up from there in the upper left, we have a lot of cities that haven't built anything but have experienced phenomenal growth and have seen uh, sales prices climb astronomically along with it. Uh, you can see Denver there is the, uh, there's nine dots above it, so we're the 10th most expensive housing market in the country, and we've built just about less housing since 1990 than, than anybody. Um, you know, we're not quite as bad as, uh, you know, a bunch of these uh, California cities or New York yet, uh, but I will point out that this data I found on the internet uh, goes through 2013, uh, from the same study, they said that the median housing price in, uh, in, in the Denver metro area allows about 50% of people making the average area uh, income to afford a house. Well, that was when houses here cost 325. That was that was four years ago, and the median home price in Denver is already over $400,000. We're closer to what San Francisco was four years ago when in San Francisco only 14% of people um, could actually afford a median priced home with a median salary, which in San Francisco is way higher than Denver it was then, it still is now. Uh, and so to that one point of the back and forth debate about growth, it's good to keep in mind, yes, building more housing will reduce housing prices. The cities that have done it have seen housing prices go lower and maintain affordability and maintain the quality of life of people being able to simply remain in the city and not get forced out, not get priced out, as is happening to a number of folks I know. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Good evening. If you give us your name and address for the record. C.C. Ortley. My address is 1803 South Dover Way. I had an appointment with a rodent professional this afternoon. I live approximately three quarters of a mile east of where South Lee Street is located. The gentleman told me that the rats that I have seen running through my yard during broad daylight are coming from the stream, the creek, that is located directly behind my home. If you pull out a map and you locate my home on 1803 South Dover Way and where the rat house is, you can see that there is a direct connection there between waterways. If we have any farmers in the room, we all know where rats travel. Lakewood, you have a problem here, folks, and it is not restricted to one home. I was here again two Mondays ago, and I appreciate the horror that was reflected on your faces. And I appreciate the fact that you all have taken the time to go over there and see the hazard that has been created. But this is not in just one home anymore, folks. We have a rat problem in Lakewood. And I hate to be cynical, but if you really want to reduce home prices and growth in Lakewood, publicize that. I think we have better publicity to give Lakewood than this problem. This gentleman, Pest Mafia, his name is Isaac Wartons, tells me that these streams need to be treated, folks, not the one house anymore. It's this whole area, Kendrick Lake, Jewel Lake, the apartments have had problems, and I think it's time, really, to get Jefferson County Health Department involved. Lakewood is not a sanitary uh, pest mafia, wildlife and pest control operation. 
we need some ex experts here, and I know you all have been Googling fumigation. I would like to ask the city attorney to proceed post haste in enforcing the code that deals with trash in our city. That's the code that gives the 30 days after the posted date, which was June 22nd. Now we're looking at July 22nd, I believe. In any event, I looked up the arrest number that I was provided by the city information officer. There is no such record in the court county system. So is it a building department judge who's overseeing this? Is it a county court judge? These are the questions I would like answered. I'm a paralegal, I'm no lawyer, and I certainly don't have a JD, but by God, I would like some answers. And I have promised the people that have lived next door to this situation that I will provide them every assistance available to a citizen, open record citizen, to get the information involved in this matter. And that's all I have. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Councilor Abel, did you have a comment on public comment? I have a question on public comment. <coughs> have we, uh, Mr. Cox, had considered declaring this a nuisance, this rat house? Uh, all options have been considered, uh, frankly, including that. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're continuing to work on. Uh, while progress is being made th <clears throat> through the extermination process, uh, it's, it's difficult to start on the cleanup of the house until you have the, the rat problem resolved. Um, but all options are being kept open at this point. One of the reasons I ask is because under the uh, nuisance ordinance, they have seven days to abate the problem that gives them one week if it's not done then the city takes over and i think that would be probably the most efficient and effective manner to handle this one of my concerns is that the rats have already established a greater than normal population around the lakes that greater than normal population is going to give them an in, a boost for continued increases throughout the years. So the problem, as the lady said, is no longer just with that house. It's the entire ecosystem around it. And uh, this year of having rats breed uncontrolled has greatly exacerbated that. What are we doing to... <coughs> reduce that infestation or the the potentially booming population in natural areas around this house i i can't speak to what's being done about that infestation i can tell you that we when we first became aware of this problem and met with several departments to map out a strategy uh, one of the first things we heard was that there have been rats around those bodies of water and in those areas uh, in much lesser numbers uh, over the years, and that that certainly a contributing factor uh, to the house that's been in question. But this, the the idea that this is a bigger problem than one house uh, has been uh, uh, tossed about prior prior to this. We have engaged the Jefferson County Health Department. Um, I'm not sure what they've done lately. I, I waited this afternoon for Chief McCaskey's update, which we heard from uh, earlier this evening, uh, to find out what the latest has been. And I, uh, I don't see any indication that the health department is, is back involved, but we certainly will get on the, on the horn with them and uh, get them to come out and look at this part of the equation. I would suggest time is of the essence and we consider declaring a nuisance and taking it onto our shoulders to take care of this as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay. So, yep, thank you for everybody. Um, Ms. George, I apologize that nobody reached out to you. Um, I thought that we had your information. Maybe we didn't, so that'll change. I'm not quite sure why you were referred to another council member instead of the professionals, but that's a, a good way to go, and we'll make sure that we follow up and, um, and, and go from there. And you may be back another Monday. 
absolutely. So I'm not sure the conditions of a special use permit or anything along those lines. Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just quickly on that, I did, uh, after uh, Ms. George's last uh, appearance here, uh, coincidentally, we had a, a, a call about an incident at a different shooting range, not having to do with noise, but something completely different happened right around the same time. So we had started some preliminary research, and um, I'd be happy to discuss the findings of that research with, with Ms. George. I, I think I'd prefer to take it offline because it has to do with, with uh, uh, the application of state law versus uh, local regulation. So if uh, Ms. George, if you could get me your number, I'll be happy to give you a call. We just got it. We got it. So, okay. Thank you. So we'll, we'll address that. Um, Mr. Buckley, you're timely. We have a housing committee that's getting ready to start meeting. So uh, always welcome citizen input, and, and that's actually to start to peel the onion of a housing study and to look at our housing stock and what we have, what we don't have. And I would just lastly close with, um, again, uh, echoing that staff has this council's full support to expedite everything possible to get this situation resolved for the folks um, on Lee Street and those people surrounding. And I think um, while you're in the bubble, it's miserable, absolutely. And, and I can tell you that every department in the city that touches this is on board, working daily to try to figure out what to do and how to do. And then when this is all done, it will be a great opportunity to kind of do an autopsy of the process to see if there was a gap or gaps that need to be addressed, whether it's with the Jefferson County Department of Health, the county, the city of Lakewood, what we need to do to ensure that this doesn't happen again. And, and I know that um, you know, you've reached out to everybody and, and folks up here really do care. And we have a fiduciary responsibility, not only to you, but to that person who owns that house as well. And that's where this gets to be sticky is ownership, property rights, things like that. And so while it's not overnight, those are the things that we're sifting through. And, and you referenced a case number. I believe the municipal court would probably be the one handling this at this point. Is that accurate? So would it be a city of Lakewood municipal court case number? Uh, municipal court would be involved. The building division has also taken some, okay. some of the action. So Caitlin, Caitlin is a great resource in trying to get you those daily updates. I'd encourage you to continue to communicate with her you'll have an opportunity to have a neighborhood meeting. You know, I'm certainly, if, if you'd like me in attendance as well, we're all hands on deck and we all want to help. But we also don't want to get in the way and we don't want to misrepresent or tell you bad information. And I think some of that's happened by potentially folks on this body who are meaning to do well, but the effort because of all the communication hasn't been as coordinated. So let's keep working with Caitlin and count and staff knows that you have our full support to expedite and do whatever you need to do to rectify this situation yes ma'am may i add two more points one is um so councillor gutwein and harrison have asked um staff to be present at this meeting whatever the meeting is called and we're happy to do that and we will have a high level employee who oversees code enforcement so um, that person will be able to answer any and all questions that citizens may have in addition as we internally are looking at what what happened and what were some of the roadblocks from a staff perspective we are convening a group of uh, representatives from different departments who are going to look at recommendations that will be forwarded to you as it relates to some stronger language in our ordinances that allow us to that talk about entering a residence so that we don't have to wait for a court order and to hit these certain standards so this is um, a new situation and we will take a proactive role um, before everything's resolved even and start talking about what we would recommend for stronger language and ordinance to prevent this happening again. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Franks. And Mr. Cox, what I would want to ask is because over the last couple of years that I've been on council, we've had a number of, I'm going to call them noise complaints from various sources. So as you kind of convey the information about how state law and local law, it'd be helpful for us to understand because we, 
the code, it's a bit vague and it's hard to interpret and there's, you know, so I would really want to know how can we, we've had people come with, you know, fireworks noise complaints, we had people with driving noise complaints, we've had people with, you know, just loud, how can we understand noise as a, um, as an irritant to our, to our citizens and better be able to communicate what the laws do and don't allow and then also see where we may have gaps in our current ordinance that are leaving people at risk. So I'd, I'd want to let to turn into a more holistic uh, discussion discussion with council at some point. Absolutely, no problem with that. The the uh, issue I want to discuss with Ms. George is specific to state regulation of shooting ranges. So it, it's not going to have any real impact on anything else, um, but we certainly do get those complaints. And there are two kinds of noise ordinances, the objective ones where you take a measurement from a certain location and if it exceeds that number, you, you have a, a case. And the subjective ones that are determined by what's reasonable under the circumstances. Lakewood has had both over the years. They both have their pluses and minuses and we're always striving to find the, the best balance. So I'm happy to engage in that discussion with council. And I think we also had a brief presentation about this within the last 12 months. So that could be out there. So, all right. So let's move on to the consent agenda. I'm going to spare the script because it looks like item eight is only accepting minutes of the boards and commissions. So I'll ask the clerk to please read it in. Consent agenda is item eight only, accepting minutes of the Advisory Commission for an Inclusive Communities Executive Committee meetings of March 7th and April 4th, their full commission meeting of March 21st, their annual planning session of March 10th, and the Historic Preservation Commission meeting minutes of May 15th, all 2018. Thank you. I'll now open the public hearing on the consent agenda. Nobody's signed up. Anybody wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close and ask for a motion. Mayor Paul, I move for the acceptance of the minutes and the boards and commissions and all which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the city clerk. I second. All right, we have a motion and second. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. It's 11 I zero nay, passes. All right, will the clerk please read item nine into the record? Item 9, Ordinance 0 2018 12, adding a new Chapter 2.55 to the Lakewood Municipal Code, establishing the Budget and Audit Board and appointing the members thereto, and abolishing the Ad Hoc Budget and Audit Committee created by Resolution 2017 47. I'll now open the public hearing on Item 9. Nobody's indicated to speak. I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion. I move for the adoption of Ordinance 2018-12 on second and final reading. Is there a second? I second. All right, we have a motion and a second, and Councilor Bita has an amendment. Thank you, Mayor. I would move to amend the ordinance per the... Uh, for the amendment that's on everybody's desk there, um, uh, specifically page two on the back. And the, if I if I could just, you want an ex explanation? Please just, yeah, if you want to just give a brief overview. We discussed it at first reading, but yeah. this is the finalized, so this is great. Yeah, and so the, the, the uh, amendment is to readjust, to adjust the terms of the citizens on the board as we as we discuss and it's in conformant conformity with the uh, intent of the policies and procedures committee which addressed this back early this year in about February and um, we had decided how we were going to do the do the uh, the uh, the, the uh, terms for the citizen board members we were going to um, do a staggered uh, term and so that's what this does, just in, to go along with what policies and procedures group did back in February. And then the other thing that we, that we did was we added a chairman, or a chair, I should say, uh, to the committee, and that's uh, in red there. So uh, that, 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 those were the only changes. This has gone through legal counsel, and, and I think uh, there were changes that are reflected there are have been approved or uh, done by 
uh, our legal counsel as well. That's correct, sir. Perfect. So, Mr. Cox, um, as far as the, the motion to amend, um, do we need something spoken into the record or can the, the motion be made based upon? It looks like, uh, how would you like it, I guess? Well, uh, um, the council has uh, had this version and it has all the changes in it. it uh, it's usually helpful to have uh, the precise, at least the precise sections identified where the changes are located. So the third whereas clause and, and the addition of a, of a um, sixth whereas clause, a change to 2.55.010 in the title. Those are the, the specific areas, uh, 2.55020 concerning the chair and uh, the changes to 030 concerning the terms of office. Um, that so potentially I could just read and then Councilor Bita could say so moved and we could do a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the motion would be in the third whereas uh, an ad hoc committee is by definition authorized to fulfill a temporary purpose, but the city council, and this is the addition, desires the budget and audit committee to have continuous existence and then go down and there's a new whereas before now therefore be it ordained and that new whereas is whereas it is the determination of city council that a chair who also serves on city council is necessary for the efficient operation of the budget and audit committee and then section 2.55.020 uh, board chair comma board composition slash chair i'll just read the whole paragraph that's yep. that's fine i uh, did want to point out there is a change in the title of the addition of a word to section 255010 established sake of completeness that's right okay. so section 2.55.010 in the title budget and audit board addition is established and then back to uh, 2.55.020 composition slash or comma chair. The budget and audit board shall be comprised of six members of which three shall be citizen members and three shall be members of the city council. At the first meeting of each calendar year, the members of the budget and audit board. Is that right? Okay. Budget and audit. Uh, Board shall elect a chair from among the three city council members who shall serve for a one-year term. The chair shall preside over all meetings and may undertake other duties as may be approved by the board. And then in section 2.55.030, um, it would start with, after the initial terms and appointments as shown below, all citizen members shall be appointed by, by council resolution for three-year terms commencing on January one and ending on December 31st. The city council members shall be appointed as stated in the council policies and procedures. Initial terms and appointments as follows. Um, uh, John Ludwigson term ends December 31st, 2020. Donald Tallman term ends December 31st, 2019. And a vacant seat um, given up by Tim Dennis, which that isn't in there. Term ends December 31st, 2021. So that would be the motion. Amended. Say so moved. I so move. Okay. Second it. Okay. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Councillor Gutwine. I just had a quick question about uh, the chair um, from among the council members, and just apologize for not knowing this, but is this the same language as we have in our other boards, um, or I guess other like? For example, ACIC would be a board and commission, or is it the same as the other boards? It is different language um, because of the mixed composition of council members and um, citizens, and it was the desire of, in this case, the, the mover, the maker of the motion to amend, uh, that it be a council member that was discussed internally, uh, just because of the continuity of having council members uh, chair the, the commission while the, or the board in this case. So in other cases, sometimes it could be a citizen. No, we don't have a mixed or, board of council. I'm, I'm not sure if there is a commissioner. I guess that's, that's, yeah. So could, could uh, Councillor Beto, would you mind just giving me a brief overview of why 
why you wanted to add this. Why? You mean the chair for a chair? Mm -hmm. Well, because right now there is no chair. The, 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 the board has no chair. We have six members, three and three, no chair, and it didn't make sense that we not have a chair. Somebody needs to preside over the meeting. And right now, from my experience, it's been just kind of a flows along and there's no real, you know, control of what's going on. So um, just all, all boards, all committees have a chair. And so we f I felt like we needed to have one. And this, as uh, our council stated, this is the only board that I know of where we have both citizens and counselors. And so I felt like we needed to have that chairperson be from our council so that we could, uh, you know, have the interaction between the board and the and the uh, uh, and the council, and you know the continuity, so to speak. Sure. And, and I felt that it was really our responsibility, as as a counselor, to really one of us to run the meetings. So that's my reasoning. That makes sense to me. I, the reason I'm asking, I was on the this board um, or the budget and audit committee, I guess. Um, it was called at the time and it w what is important to me is that this is not um doesn't become political and agenda setting and all of that because i think it's really important that we get unbiased factual information um at this meeting and so you know that that's my only concern with this change um and so i just wanted to raise that question uh as we're discussing this. Can I, can I respond? Yeah. Please, sir. Well, it is my, th my thinking that if there is one committee, board, or whatever that is maybe more important than anything else, it's our budget because that drives everything else that this city does. That's how we pay our bills. That's how we, and it's how we uh, fund our, the policies of this board. And so, uh, to say, uh, could it become political? Well, sure, it's going to be political. Be I think there's no question because there are going to be times when the policies of this board are going to be discussed in terms of the funding and the budgeting, and, and, and we want to make sure that our, uh, the policies of this board are being reflected as, in the budgeting matters. I mean, that, to me, that's how it should work. And so, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly how how I would anticipate that this would work, and I would think that would, that would give you great comfort because again we can't decide anything. Ultimately, whatever this board does is going to come back to council, and this council is going to make the final decision. It's the the idea is in my mind is to more um, kind of just like all other committees, sort of streamline what we do so that when it comes here, it takes less of your time and. You know, you can debate the issues that really are pertinent and not spend time on, you know, you know, uh, things that are not really, re you know, important or relevant. So that's, I think that's the idea is to, to sort of streamline what's done and make sure that the uh, policies of this council are reflected in the budgetary process, pure and simple. Done. All right, Council Abel. I <clears throat> am wondering why having a chairman of a committee would cause the quality of information to suffer, which is what you just said. Dana, or Councilwoman Gutwine, said that she had some question about how. Sure. Well, all I wanted to ask is that I, you know, we, the the budget is the pul the ultimate most important direction that we as a body give, and we do that as a body, and the budget and audit committee, you know, I want to make sure that we get unbiased information from that committee, and that the what goes on there is reflective of what all of us direct so I would 
that's all I'm saying is that I think that it needs to reflect the body as a whole. We do have that checks and balances in place. Um, and I guess, I mean, it sounds like the intent is to make this a more political process, which I'm not sure is best serving the community as a whole moving forward. So I'm just raising the question. I don't necessarily know that that's the case. So if I may. I, I just I, I don't get the connection. I'm sorry. We have a number of committees. I don't want to belabor the thing, but we have a number of committees, and the chairman on the committee doesn't affect the quality of the information. They all have chairmen in our committees. Uh, are you trying to infer that if we elect a chairman from this committee that's divided 3-3 three, three, that it would somehow be biased? I guess what I'm saying is that this is a council manager form of government and the budget is prepared along with staff. So this is different from a lot of our other committees where we are doing, like for example, the legislative committee, we have, uh, we are reviewing policies and we are policy makers, but none of us up here are financial directors. The budget so. is policy. The financial director helps us flesh out that policy, but I uh, never mind. I just don't get your argument. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Harrison. Well, um, I think we've had two budget not at committee meetings this year that we've attended. I think we've only had two, Mike. But what do you think? More than Jake? Half. We've had more than half. Okay, three. I, I stand corrected. What I saw in the meetings is that um, the normal process would be that our finance director, Larry Dorr, would give us an update on what was happening and the, and the suggestions. The agenda was not necessarily Larry's agenda other than the time frame of where we are in the budget and audit process. Sharon, I think you sat on this committee in the past. Um, Barb has. Uh, I was trying to think of other people. I, um, if we want to do a chairman, I mean, so be it, let's do it. But I don't feel like if I were listed as the chair of that committee, other than calling the meeting to order and saying, gee, finance director, door, can you give us the update and where are we? I don't see what a chairman would do in this particular case. Whereas in other committees, they might be a little bit more driving the discussion. Um, I'm not comfortable whatsoever in, in delivering the agenda of that committee, even though I send, sit on that committee, I don't feel like I have the knowledge to say this is as a city what we need to be working on in terms of finances for the whole thing. Larry's the one, our finance director is the one who knows where we are, what, what might need to be looked at by council and where we are in the process. Um, just my thought. So let me just interject. Um, so there actually is I'm the chair of the police pension board and it's myself and Mr. Doerr and three representatives from the police department and I am just the chair. I open the meeting and I turn it over to our professionals. The legislative committee is similar though. Councilwoman uh, uh, Johnson is the chair but uh, Ms. Nealon really does all the coordination with all the staff departments and getting the bills and brings them forth to the committee. So this isn't any different. And as long as that's how it's going to be run, I have no problems with supporting the idea of a chair. Okay. So there's four more people that want to speak. Um, I think that this council's moved in a new direction with more committees. And so we're growing into this. But I certainly don't think that the intention of a chairman is to impede any sort of uh, agenda or um, try to silence... Keep in mind those three committee members still go through council already. So those people are selected by this body already to be part of it. So I would encourage us to potentially just either vote the amendment that's on the floor up or down, um, and then we can proceed. And if you really want to speak, I will ensure that you have that opportunity. I call the question. All right. I second. 
Okay, the question has been called. Um, so please cast your votes on calling the question. And the question, Councillor Skilling Harrison. Okay, 10 ayes, one nay. So we will call the question. Um, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Please cast your votes. Please state the motion again. That's to have the chair. Yes, ma'am. That's that's the entirety of what was read. That passes 10 ayes, zero nays, the nay being Councillor Harrison. Okay. So we have a amended motion on the floor. So um, is there any more discussion as to ordinance 2018-12? Seeing none, please cast your votes. All right, that passes 11 ayes, zero nays, 2018-12 uh, as amended. Okay, will the clerk please read item 10 into the record. Item 10, ordinance 02018-13, designating the property located at 1310, 1320, and 1325 Everett Court, Lakewood, Colorado, County of Jefferson, State of Colorado, as a local historic site. Fantastic. We, um, oh, actually we'll open the public hearing on this. Nobody's wished to speak. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing, and I'll invite Holly Baim down uh, from our neighborhood planning, who's going to give a presentation. Pardon me? Okay, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm Holly Bain with Comprehensive Planning and Research. Before I start my presentation tonight, I wanted to introduce some people. With me tonight is Rachel O'Connell Wickersham, who is the owner of the property. Also is Jim Harton and Susan Ely with Hartman Ely Investment, who are uh, partner developers with Miss Wickersham and also the chair of our Preservation Commission is here Ooh, as is um, Calvin Jennings with the Commission so thank you all thank you so tonight I am asking City Council to approve the Historic Preservation Commission's recommendation to designate the site of the former Hospice of St. John as a local historic site the site is located um, at, the corner, at the intersection of Everett Court and West 13th Avenue. It sits just north of the light rail line, just east of the Garrison Station in North Lakewood. Excuse me. The site is comprised of three structures and two memorial gardens. These structures are addressed as 1310, 1320, and 1325 Everett Court. The two main structures were constructed in 1960s. They're very indicative of what would be constructed in the late, in the early 1960s, one story beige brick buildings that were used as a nursing home. The third structure, structure 1310 Everett Court, was constructed in 1996 to serve as a, um, a cabin for visitors and people that were visiting people on site. There are also two memorial gardens or contemplative gardens, which are very, very integral to the site. These gardens provided um, quiet respite for those living at the hospice or visiting the hospice. The Hospice of St. John was started in 1977 by Father Paul von Lopkowitz. He was born in 1930s in Bohemia and made his way to uh, London where he started working in the hospice industry there. He became very intrigued with the London model of the hospice industry as we didn't have them in the United States at the time. 
While he was working in London, he met with Sister Darcy, who was actually from Denver's St. Joseph Hospital at the time, and she requested that Father Paul come to Colorado and expose the United States to this form of hospice care. Father Paul obliged, and he arrived in 1976 and immediately started working at the Smith Hearts Georgian House Nursing Home, which was actually located at the 13th, um, West 13th and Everett Court site. In 1977, he started a four-bed hospice on that, on that facility, which quickly grew, and by 1984, it had taken over the entire site. The Hospice of St. John was the second hospice in the country, in the United States, and it served, he, the hospice and Father Paul both had a leading role in the national movement and development of the hospice industry. During its tenure, the hospice cared for well over 25,000 patients, regardless of race, religious affiliation, or financial means. In fact, it was probably one of the first hospices that accepted AIDS patients in the early 18, 1980s, when so many other care facilities were not accepting patients. They relied heavily on the work of dedicated volunteers that served and the nursing staff there. The hospice has been recognized in the past by all levels of government. This has included two commendations from the United States Congress, recognition uh, recognition, by former President Bill Clinton in 1997, the Colorado General Assembly, as well as former Lakewood Mayor uh, Stephen Burkholder, who proclaimed February 20, 2007 as Hospice of St. John's Month, say, stating, the, the hospice was a Colorado treasure to be honored and recognized for its 20 years of service to the community of Lakewood. Father's Paul philosophy was that a hospice is a house of healing where people come to mend relationships may, may not be whole. Father Paul passed away in 2005. The hospice closed in 2013 due to federal budget cuts. The period of significance for the hospice is from 1977, when the hospice first began operations, to 2013, when it closed its door and served its last patient. The site retains integrity, as it is in the original location, where it provided care and nursing during its 36 years um, of tenure. It maintains integrity of setting, as the site layout remains intact and the buildings and the relationship to the gardens remain as they were designed to function and serve as a hospice. And it also retains integrity of association as there maintains a direct link between the site and the historic use and character of the site. At a public hearing in May, the Preservation Commission determined that the site met Criterion A of the Historic Preservation Ordinance as being a significant contribution to the broad, broad patterns of the city of of uh, Lakewood's history. For its de decades of caring for Lakewood's residents, family members and friends, as well as its nation leading role in the development of the hospice industry and its rec recognition by all levels of government for its important community contributions. Notification for this public hearing was met pursuant to the Historic Preservation Ordinance. Notice was provided to the property owner and the applicant. Legal notice was um, published in the city's publication of record, and courtesy notice was provided to the Iber neighborhood president. In addition, the sign was posted as required two weeks prior to this public hearing. Tonight, I'm asking that city council approve the, the Historic Preservation Commission's recommendation to designate the site of the former hospice of St. John that is located at 1310, 1320, and 1320. 25 Everett Court is a local historic site. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start with Councilors Abel and Johnson. Councilor Abel. Thank you. I received Paul Ditson, the uh, president of the Auburn Neighborhood Association, sends his apologies for not being here tonight. He did send a letter uh, earlier this week, and I'd like to read from that uh, a couple of paragraphs. The Iber neighborhood fully supports this request and urges council to make the designation. It speaks to our collective interest in recognizing and preserving our neighborhood's heritage, provides another affordable housing option, and addresses the concerns of neighbors regarding the scale, traffic, and parking. 
We find the owner and developer to be compassionate regarding housing, who share our passion for historic preservation, and we trust they will do a good job of preserving the site as well as redeveloping it in a sensitive way. We ask that you please offer your support for this action. Thank you, Paul Ditson, President of the Auburn Neighborhood Association. I would like to add that my mother-in-law spent her last days there in dignity with compassion and comfort. And it is, a remar is and was a remarkable place. So, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Johnson. Thank you. Um, at one point in my career, I was a hospice nurse, mm -hmm. and I'd just like to say the Hospice of St. John's was the gold standard for this region. And frankly, many miracles happened in that building there on many levels for a variety of reasons. Um, this is a beautiful use of this historic, and frankly, this to me is a sacred site. Um, I'm grateful of the thought that has gone into this and keeping this in place. Thank you. Well, um, other folks have looked at this in very different ways for different uses, and I'm so glad we've come to this place where it's going to be for you to carry on. Um, this is a beautiful continuation of the legacy of this land and site. Thank you, and I urge you all to support it, please. Thank you. Councilor Vincent. Two words. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I'll go for a motion. Please. Yes, I move for the ordinance 2018-13 on second and final reading. I second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any more comments? I would just echo thank you. Um, I think we all have... A interesting not interesting memories but compassionate memories or we all have a story and for me my dad was a, a minister and so i remember going with him to um, visit people in the facility and, and always found it while you knew what was going on it was a special place for those folks who were there so special memories for all and i certainly will be supporting it so please cast your votes 11 i zero nays congratulations Ms. bame thank you very much Okay, general business. I have, go we ahead. A, we need a motion to hold an executive session following this meeting. I think I have one right here. <laughs> I think you got it. <laughs> I, I move that we go into an executive session pursuant to section 2.5 CC6 of the Oh, 2.15C6 of the Lakewood uh, Home Rule Charter in section 24-6, 402, parenthesis, 4, 4D. So just real, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mayor Pro Tem. I just, we got to be crystal clear on the citation. Uh, all the subsections and everything, yeah. and I, it sounds like there might have been one that so was. Okay, it, let's, it's let's start. It's 2.15C3, not 6, C3, so. Ah, I have six. That's here. You may have a different one. Do you, Barb, do you want it? Hey, I can do this one. Let's do this again. I move to go into an executive session pursuant to sections 2.15 parentheses C parentheses 3 and 2.15 parentheses C parentheses 2 of the Lakewood Home Rule Charter and section 24-6-402 parentheses 4 parentheses A and 24-6-402 parentheses 4 parentheses E of the Colorado Revived Statute for the purpose of considering uh, the purchase of real property by the city and developing strategies or, or for negotiators and instructing negotiators all concerning the proposed sale by auction of the remainder of the land known as the Taylor Estates. I further moved to adjourn this meeting from the executive session. 
I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. Okay, 11 ayes, zero nays. So just for reference of those folks who are here, we'll finish this meeting, go into an executive session, and we will not come back into, and there will be no votes taken or uh, anything along those lines in executive session. So we'll continue. Um, with item 12 executive report miss Hodson yes thank you just a couple things a reminder of the development dialogue meeting committee meeting tomorrow uh, July 10th at 6 bells 6 p.m. Um, also I'd like to uh, extend my personal thank you to all of the staff and all of the volunteers who made the big big boom bang such a wonderful event they did a lovely job um, and I'm just so proud of them and I thank you for the emails that we received from a few of you that I was able to pass on to the staff so thank you um, please make sure to participate in the parks and parks and recreation month activities especially that movie on the 15th there are so many wonderful ways that staff is able to showcase um, the programs and facilities that we have in the city and please um, encourage people to take advantage of those the movie of course reminder is july 15th um, very recently i had the opportunity to attend a retirement party and this is a special one because our own susan martin um, who actually set up the Cultural Center, was the founding leader at the Cultural Center and has done an amazing job there. She's recently retired, and that's a real legacy for us, and we'll really miss her. Uh, it was a heartfelt goodbye, and uh, there were a lot of tears because uh, she did a lot of work, and she's really um, done a lot for the city. So Susan Martin gets to enjoy life outside the city. I had the opportunity also to help hire the next Arvada police chief and they hired it was a tough competition and they hired their own link straight who has been with the department for his entire career and um, it's very deserving and he's been on the Ralston House board for a long time and has a, a really amazing career in Arvada so congratulations to him. Um, very quickly, many of you have asked me about the Action Center Shelter and the disposition thereof, as well as the Foothills Animal Shelter that we talked about in a recent county commissioners meeting. Both of those will be addressed very shortly. I believe this one this week and one next week with all of the county city managers and the county manager. So I will have an update and recommendations um, for all of you as it relates to the health of those two really important programs. Again, the Action Center Shelter as well as the Foothills Animal Shelter and the future thereof. So many of you have asked me about that and um, so I wanted to give you that update and finally a big thank you to agent Matt Shea who single-handedly um, gave a, a, a pretty a, a pretty informative training today on active shooting and I really appreciated that he had um, an actual presentation but also was really willing to answer all of the questions that we had so I wanted to publicly thank agent Matt Shea for doing it all by himself and he did a lovely job so thank you Mayor Pro Tem? No report. Elsa Johnson? No report. Elsa Vincent? Uh, our Ward 2 meeting will be at 7.30 a.m. this Wednesday at 1560, 15, tell her. Councilor Bita? No report. Councilor Franks? Uh, this Saturday, 9.30, Green Mountain Presbyterian Church, we will have our Ward 4 meeting, and the topic is municipal funding and TABOR, so should be a lively discussion. Uh, we have a staff member who will be there, along with Mayor Paul, so looking forward to this Saturday, 9.30. Should be fun. Councillor LeBeer? Uh, no report. Thanks. Councilor Abel? Yes, uh, Saturday morning, I... Uh, Enjoyed being part of the Applewood Sustainability Group's uh, Independence Day Parade. Uh, kids on bicycles, old folks on bicycles, people walking, people sitting in their yards waving us on. It was, uh, and there were a lot of folks in the parade. It was a remarkable effort, uh, followed by the 
fireworks show Friday night. Ms. Duffy was too kind. The heavy lifting was done by the ACIC and staff. All I did was persuade you folks to go along with it and provide the cash. Uh, it was a fantastic show. Uh, everyone I've talked to said it is the best ever, not for Lakewood, the best one they have ever seen. So, and it turns out that the fireworks uh, outfit is owned by the brother of the uh, gentleman who owns Mint and Serif Coffee Shop at 11500 West Colfax Avenue. So, great cup of coffee there as well. Uh, our Ward 1 meeting last Saturday was rousing. We discussed Tabor and its possibilities and implications, as well as the short-term rental uh, uh, proposal that's coming before us. And boy, did we ever get a wide bunch of opinions on both subjects and a lot of very interesting and enthusiastic comments. So. Good luck on at Ward 4 next uh, Saturday. I'll be there to watch. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Harrison. Um, I just wanted to thank all those who um, um, gave me support during the time that my husband was going through surgery. I really appreciate that. Good news is good news. Um, he's home and uh, recuperating. It's not going to be quick, but he uh, is honorary enough to where I think he'll overcome. So um, I just want to say thank you very much. You're a great group of people. Appreciate that. Councilor Skilling. Echoing that uh, tomorrow night we have our second meeting of the Development Dialogue Committee. And thank you to the staff and Margie and the other staff that's not here for their work in compiling the information for tomorrow night. The first meeting was well attended by the public and a lot of people here. Um, I would like to set aside some time in a future meeting and give a f more full report. And by then we'll have at least two, if not three meetings. We'll have three meetings under our belt in the committee. And uh, I would like to give a better report. But that's tomorrow night at 6. And we have... Uh, newsletters still available that Barb puts together very well. Those are still available. You can reach out to us, uh, email us, and we'll get that to you. Thank you. No report. All right. So I have a couple quick things I want to talk about. It's been a couple weeks. I would also echo Mean Street's uh, family day shelter has also been shut down. So we are definitely without shelter in Jefferson County on all levels. So I hope that we have some some decent ideas on how to move forward. So I look forward to hearing from our city manager about what that looks like. Had an incredible opportunity to celebrate a unique group of people, the Jeffco Platoon, which was 50 young men who joined uh, 45 years ago, all signed up on the same day to go to Vietnam. And through Scott Hefty and uh, the support of the city of Lakewood, they had a ceremony out here to honor those men. And there's a bench now in front of the police department that honors them and to hear their stories. And a special shout out to County Manager Don Davis, who did an incredible job. And I think he, he speaks that language, although he's a Marine vet and the Army guys gave him a little bit of a hard time. But, sure. but please go over and um, check out that bench and... and you can see, you know, the different names and quite an honor and, and wonderful stories of bravery. Um, summer concert series, Hazel Miller is Wednesday night, Lakewood's favorite. So get out there if you can. Caffeine Cruise is at 9.30 a.m. starting at uh, the Village Roaster on Saturday, um, Saturday the 14th. So that is the second ride. It's kind of modeled after the Denver Cruisers which has uh, had great popularity throughout uh, the Denver area. First Friday in the 40 West Arts District is always fun, but the Colfax Museum is moving to our West Colfax. And uh, Johnny Colfax was there, and he's quite a character. And so he talked about how Jack Kerouac, because people said, why are you moving the, West Col or the Colfax Museum to Lakewood? And he said, well, Jack Kerouac hung out in Denver, but he bought a house in Lakewood. So... They have the pop-up museum there for a few weeks, and they're looking for a more permanent position at pastor, at pastor camps is where they're at right now. So that was really cool. A lot of great support. And I mentioned that our cultural center was the fourth largest 
uh, attendance increase of cultural facilities. But guess who saw the largest visitation of cultural facilities in the metro area? The Jeffco Public Library. More than the Denver Zoo, more than the museums, Jefferson County Public Library. So hats off to them, and I know they have a new executive director. So that's all I have, and we're going to move into executive session, and again, we will adjourn from there.